Welcome to We Are Libertarians. This is episode 144. I am uh, on my own today. It's Easter Sunday, so Greg couldn't make it. Uh, but this is a special episode of We Are Libertarians. Uh, it's reminiscent of Rachel's story, uh, episode 91, where we talk about the true cost of government, where we talk about uh, the processes that are set up that don't often work. And we, a lot of times, sit and think, well, who is going to do this, who is going to do that, but then once you start to examine how the bureaucracies actually operate, you realize real people are getting hurt, and today's uh, issue surrounds uh, a really good friend of mine, uh, somebody that I've known since high school and has become like a sister to me over the last couple of years, and it's about uh, a family gone wrong, domestic violence, and then the fallout and uh, Amanda's journey over the last few years. Obviously, names have been changed. We're not going to, to be very specific about timelines and um, many details just to, to, to respect the privacy of everybody involved, but Amanda courageously wants to sit down and tell her story because Partly because, first and foremost, well, I mean, why do you want to tell your story? How about I let you tell your story? And I apologize for all the cats. Uh, <laughs> Amanda actually lived with me for a brief period of time, and uh, her son is allergic to cats, and so the cats were always locked away in the bedroom. So you actually haven't seen Mittens and Cornelius. Mittens is really wanting attention today, so I apologize. Uh, so why do you want to tell your story? Dream. Right. So, this is uh, this was somebody that you married. Uh, why don't you talk about a little bit about the beginning? I mean, be brief about the beginning of the marriage, but just to give some context to where all this journey starts. Well, I was way too young. Um, I had a child out of wedlock. My family put a lot of pressure on me to find him a suitable father, and so I got married way too young and way too fast. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, what are what are some? If we have any ladies out there listening, we have a lot of young females listening. What are some tips that you would uh, give in selecting somebody that you're going to connect to? Oh, just give it time. People can't hold up an act forever. They can hold it up for a year or two more. Right. But they can't hold it up forever. Um, you know, and don't be don't be blind to their flaws. An important thing is accepting people, including their flaws, because everyone has them. And if you can't think of a flaw about that person, then you're not seeing all of them. Right, so you really have to give a relationship time to give yourself perspective. And you also have to have, I think, a, a lot of your own personal wisdom worked out. And You have I, to keep yourself removed from the relationship. Don't yeah. be so in love and so enamored that you lose yourself. I also think, um, the beginning of that relationship, as you said, your family kind of pressured you into it. You were marrying for someone other than yourself. Yes. Yeah. I got married because that's what I was supposed to do, and that's what I should have done for my son. Right. Uh, so you you go on to eventually have a daughter with this person, which will factor into a lot of this. What were some of the early warning signs that you saw in, in the breakdown of the relationship? Well, I... From six months on into the marriage, I left him more times than I could possibly count going back. Um, just from, you know, I couldn't wash the dishes the correct way. The way I'd been washing the dishes my entire life up to that point was wrong. And I was surely going to poison him or my own child, and he was surprised for real life because I didn't wash the dishes using the specific brushes and sponges in the specific order that he uses them to wash the dishes. Mm -hmm. Um, I couldn't load a dishwasher right. Every time I loaded it, he reloaded it. Um, if he found out that I made my meatballs with cinnamon, that was a huge deal when he found out I put cinnamon in my meatballs. He'd been eating them for three years at that point when he found out, and all of a sudden I was poisoning him and a terrible, awful person. So very over the top, very dramatic, but I mean, can you kind of identify for people that controlling behavior? So anybody's listening out there and is in a situation like this, they can understand sort of what those signs of a controlling mate might be. Well, 
first of all, it's not presented in a controlling manner or an over-the-top manner at all. Generally, it's something subtle like, oh, you put cinnamon in that? Oh, I really don't want to eat something you put cinnamon into. Don't you want to make me happy? Mm -hmm. um, it's very compliant, very, you know, like they're almost trying to be supportive of you and help make you into a better person, but really what they're doing is slowly taking away, you know, the characteristics that make you you. Right. And it starts off with small minor things such as loading the dishwasher and it leads to bigger things um, such as not having your own bank account and you don't even know that it's happening you don't even see it it's dressed in the guise of i'm an authority i'm here to help you let me do that for you and then that's how it starts to to move forward not always things that like i was very adamant that we he was adamant we have a joint account um, he did not want to have a split money, he said that's part of the union of marriage. And I could understand that and respect that, and he approached it from a very logical standpoint. So um, after a few months, I was willing to open a joint account with him. What I never knew, because he said he would handle the switch over and all the changes so I wouldn't have to deal with it to make it easy, since I was compromising with him, and that's how he would always approach it was that he actually, in fact, left me off of our joint account. So for five years, I had no bank account and didn't know that until the end of the fifth year when I tried to call in about not being able to access any money with my debit card. Which eventually plays into you ha you having a hard time leaving. Yes. Well, you have no money. You have no access to your money. Your money is going to what you thought was a joint account. Um, it makes it very difficult to leave. So... I mean, I think it's hard for me to understand just not having access to my money. I mean, how? why do you think you freely gave up that control? Well, I thought it was a joint account. I thought it was both his and mine. He had a card. I had a card. Um, you know, he was my husband. I was supposed to be able to trust him to handle that changeover. Right. And to handle it correctly. And instead of what he did is he put himself as a primary account holder. And he put myself, myself on there as someone who was able to use... A debit card and access certain information well when the policy renewed one year he missed renewing me on it so mm. all of a sudden I couldn't use my card and I knew something was wrong right so what are, what are some of the other signs um, I mean part of you also rushed into this and there was a lot of pressure to commit as quickly as possible that's always another sign that I've noticed in these stories well a big part of it was I had serious doubts on the wedding day just everything felt so rushed and I didn't feel like things were okay and I said to him let's call it off let's wait a year and let's let's do this in a year and he said to me you know my family's here they've traveled out of town to be here we're doing this now and we're not doing it all this is not fair of you or right of you to do that and logically yes that makes complete and total sense but if he'd really cared about me his response would have been I understand you know no matter what it costs we'll wait till you're ready right yeah, that makes sense. I mean, it's it's it, it was was it it sounds like a lot of putting himself first and then emotionally manipulating you into doing what he wanted. I think it was just a lot of logical operations. He operated very logically like this makes the most sense. This is what we do. And it wasn't anything about anyone else's feelings. Um and then over the years it became I was his possession. Mhm. Mm um, since in the beginning he could get away with it's all based upon logic you know in the end it came down to he owned me he had more money he could have control of the bank account whether I knew it or not um, he pawned my stuff behind my back um, my mom gave me a string of pearls when I graduated high school um, I found out on our third wedding anniversary when I put them, went to put them on that he had pawned them because I barely ever wore them. He just felt like I didn't need them. Mm. Also controlled a lot of what you wore, a lot of what you, I mean, just your whole person, he really eventually became to control all of that, right? Yes, yes. By our fifth year of marriage, um, there were shirts that I loved that I never wore because every time I put them on, all I heard about was how awful I looked in them, how terrible it was that I wore them to the point that I didn't even want to wear them anymore. Right. Um, and you know, by that point in the relationship, you you trust them quite a bit because they have been 
helping take care of you mm -hmm. and you think you've been helping take care of them for years but what really has been happening is they are ever so slightly putting you down and abusing that trust to gain complete control was there ever any physical violence um not a ton we had i mean i think i think really the worst of it is he he would always ask me why couldn't i be like other people uh, particularly his sister-in-law he said that she never yells in arguments she just throws stuff at her his brother and that's what he preferred and so after telling me that in a fight i chalked a bunch of eggs above his head and <laughs> let them run down where he was sitting and he did tackle me and i smacked him and he he eventually um, let me be but he was very careful not to leave a hand not to leave any marks to leave any hands on me um, but uh, unless it came to the bedroom mm -hmm. and then he felt like he could do whatever he wanted whether I was awake or asleep this is actually something that I've learned from you that is horrifying is is partner rape essentially is that people feel that because you are in a relationship that other person owes you something it was my wifely duty as my family who is um, a minister mm -hmm. and even the court of law to use it it's um, very very difficult to convict your spouse of rape because it's your, considered your marital duty to the other person even the courts have come down on that I mean I mean that's they actually when I was going through everything I was going through they were very very happy the prosecutor's office were because they just got their very first conviction on marital rape mm -hmm. because they were able to prove that the wife had been drugged and they were able to trace it down to what type of drugs it were and actually link him directly to buying those specific drugs Wow! and that was their first conviction in Indiana for marital rape which is actually heartbreaking. I mean, it, it's, it, I, I'll let the listener, uh, I don't need to analyze it. I mean, it, it should be pretty self-evident that other people are not your property, especially to this off audience. Um, no person, regardless of contract, which is what a marriage certificate is, it's, it, it has no bearing other than legal contract. That doesn't mean that you've bought a person and that they are your property to own. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry that's I think that's tough to hear but thank you for sharing that because I think that that is something that is not talked about in society and I have come to find out over the last couple of years in talking to friends that's more common than you think and it is incredibly disturbing and if you are engaged in it then seek help on whichever side you're on um, but you know, libertarianism fundamentally is about respecting the individual, and partly why I believe in this philosophy is that I love other individuals, I love the humanity of other people, and, you know, in our personal lives we should exercise love for the other individual, and that's just a clear example of uh, not respecting the humanity of other people. and. If you can't respect the humanity of the people that you've uh, made a vow to love and respect and you can't respect your neighbors and you have poor relationships and you don't treat people like they're human beings in your personal life, then you're never going to get a larger political philosophy. Um, so I think that's just, that is the core tenet. Um, so when did you start to make the decision to leave? Because I mean, talk about the, the, the lead up to leaving and the difficulties that go into getting out of an abusive relationship. Um, the actual decision to leave for me happened very, very quickly. Um, I had come to the resolution after I found out that I was gonna have my daughter who was unplanned that I was pretty well trapped there until my children were grown. Mm -hmm. um, talking to my family and them saying, it's typical, it's what a marriage is, this is how most men are that's what they do um, and them saying if you weren't okay with that you should have never married anyone you probably shouldn't have had kids you know you're gonna have to make yourself model this family role because that's what a family should be um, and then he was being himself nothing had changed but 
I just found myself at a point of exhaustion and he was trying to do things I didn't want him to do and he was making every effort to do them and I said if you want to do those things find yourself a man to do them with mm -hmm. and he said you wouldn't consider that cheating and I said if it means you don't touch me anymore please have at it I'll help you find someone if I have to mm -hmm. um, and with that on my mind already I was feeling pretty much like I can't believe those words came out of my mouth and I'm still right. staying here and then I came home from work the next day and found out that my son had been locked in his bedroom and that this had been happening routinely when he got home off the bus because my ex did not want to put up with having to take care of him while I was still at work. What was roughly your son's age range during this time period? I mean... He was about five years old. Okay. So the abuse didn't just extend to you, it extended to, you know, your son, eventually your daughter. It did. And that's the first time that I saw that it was affecting my kids. Mm -hmm. um, the next week when I was at work, he called me to come home early, called our three-month-old daughter a bitch because she wouldn't stop crying. When I got home, I discovered in the five hours that I had worked, he'd not once fed her. Oh, wow. That was my decision to leave. I left within three days. And so how did you, I mean, you, when you left, I mean, you probably didn't leave with anything. I mean, you had no money, no, what possessions I, did could you even take? I would have left that night if it hadn't taken me three days to get my next paycheck not direct deposited into his account. Mm. Um, and that's really when I found out that it was his account, was trying to, um, I had an issue with the card earlier and he had to call to get it resolved. So I was already kind of suspicious. And then when I went to see if I could get my check um, into a sub account of that account, because that's what I was gonna do, was just break off from him. The bank told me, well, you're not even on this account. You're just on here as a user. So how do you, uh, I mean, talk about the process of leaving. I think if, if anybody listening is in this situation, I mean, what goes into it emotionally? What kind of planning do you put forth? You're a very uh, strategic thinker, logical thinker. I mean, so you always have a plan for everything and execute flawlessly, but I don't know that everybody in that situation has such the skills that you do. I mean, so can you talk about the process of leaving and what you had to do to, to get to that point? It started off as a well-executed plan. Um, I simply talked to him and said, look, you know, I'm really not okay with the, this is before I knew he was locking my son up and calling my daughter a bitch. Um, I said, I'm really not okay with you wanting to, you know, do those things with a guy. I'm not okay with you wanting a relationship outside of it. I'm not okay with you doing it to me. And I, I'd been going to marriage counseling by myself for many months before then. And I said, I, you know, I see what the counselor's saying now and I'm done. What was the counselor saying to you? She kept telling me it was okay to leave. And at first it didn't compute as to why she was saying that. Um, but then I could see it clear as day and I told him that I felt like he should go. Mm -hmm. You asked him to leave. I did. I said, the kids need a house. They need a place to stay. Michael's in school here. I don't want to have to transfer him. Um, I think that you should leave. Take whatever you want. I'll replace whatever's left since I'm going to keep the house. But you should go. That's awfully brave considering, I mean, you're in this situation where you work up the nerve. I mean, were you afraid to have that conversation? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. But at that point, I mean, I was so insulted and just... In such non-belief that I've lost myself right that I wanted to get myself back yeah that's uh, difficult I think it's it's so easy when you get trapped in in these emotional states when you get trapped in a situation it's hard to see yourself out of it and then once you finally kind of dig yourself out of that hole and you get your arms above the hole on the on the rest of the land you and you kind of pull yourself out you look down at that hole and you go holy shit where did I go and that loss of identity, I think, is incredibly difficult for, for anybody in any situation, but especially in this situation where you've been, for many years, you've been, I mean, would it be fair to say treated like a soldier? You know, where it's... No, I think more like a leper. <laughs> yeah. You know, I think people hear, oh, you're a, a victim, or oh, you, you know, you 
got yourself into this bad situation, you deserve it. Hmm. Victim blaming. Yeah. A lot. That's a... That blows my mind. Uh, but I have seen it so often over the last couple of years because domestic violence just wasn't a part of uh, my world. I just didn't... I, I mean, you don't... I didn't have friends. And, and then you and I, the way that we connected is... You know, Memorial Day weekend a couple of years ago, um, you had a Facebook question and you posted it and I responded and helped you lock down your account and you told me the story and you're at the local women's shelter and uh, we got to talking and then helped, you know, you collect things and you guys stayed with me for a little bit and just going through the story and going through part of this odyssey with you has been so disheartening because so many people consider you the problem they do they do well, including the police <laughs> why why do you think that is like what is the in it's, your mind what is the it's what we teach our kids meaning what well even if you look at tv shows that you know we grew up and our parents grew up watching you know, for example my mom had me watch a, a maid marion and robin hood movie um, starring Sean Connery and Audrey Hepburn, which are two of my favorite actors and mm -hmm. actresses, so she thought it would be, you know, right up my alley. But the whole time I was sitting there through it, if, if you've never heard it, spoiler alert here. Um, so in the end, Maid Marian has been waiting for Sean Connery for decades while he's been out fighting. Uh, Sean Connery gets back, admits to her that he's been with several different women. She's become a nun, Maid Marian has, Audrey Hepburn. And now she's you know she doesn't want to lose him again mm -hmm. and he promises her he'll stay with her and then he decides he's going to go off and fight again so she poisons him she kills him <laughs> and he realizes that she's killed him and he starts to fight and he calls for little john to come and help rescue him and then he asks her why he did it and she tells him it's because she loves him more than she loves god and then he decides it's okay to die, and he shoots his arrow off into space and says, bury the two of us toge together wherever this arrow lands. So mm -hmm. then she drinks the poison and dies with him. And my mom is sitting beside me talking about how romantic it is and how that's true love. And I'm thinking that's all sorts of abusiveness just gone wrong. Right. I mean, it's anything but love. It's, you know, she lost her identity waiting for him, and it ultimately killed the two of them you know he had control over her he should have never had and it just um you know it just it's an ideal example of this is what our parents grew up believing is true love so when they taught us what love is it's demented and wrong right and you know i was always told growing up i could do anything a guy could do but i needed a guy right um you know and I think most of this generation can agree that we were told, you know, marriage is very important. We, we should aspire to and desire to get married. And we heard stories about how parents got married at younger ages. Um, but when we look at that, and if we really look at that, that's really when the divorce rate went up. Mm -hmm. You know, that's really when the unhappy homes happened. And I think the double-edged sword there is saying, you know, as a woman, you can do whatever you want to do. But as a wife, you have to do whatever the man tells you to do. Right. You know, that doesn't coincide together. That's not really what a union is. And biblically, yes, it says the man should be the head of the household, but it doesn't say the man should be a, you know, pardon my language, but a douchebag who's not going to listen or take into consideration the feelings and opinion of his wife. Yeah. We say much, uh, much worse things in this <laughs> program. And pull that mic a little bit. Pull the mic stand closer. There you go. Um... So where did you learn the skills to analyze? I mean, how did you kind of pull yourself out of that old world mindset? And what resources did you access? What tools did you give yourself? I mean, if you're sitting out there and you're thinking, like, because you changed my relationship with women, our relationship, because I didn't think I was doing anything wrong. I thought I was the nice guy. And then when I broke down, kind of, you broke down for me like no the nice guy is m emotional manipulation here is here's manipulation here's manipulation here's controlling here's controlling and I don't want to be like that and so as soon as you pointed it out I immediately started seeking help <laughs> and which has kind of led me to 
therapy and a lot of the growth that that I've I've talked about on here and on creating Maya. But where did you learn your skills? I mean, has what books did you read? What seminars did you go? Did you go to therapy? I mean, how did you kind of get to this place of health through it all? I spent a lot of my life in therapy that I just didn't care for. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to say, oh, it was all because of therapy, but really the only therapy that helped me was the therapy after we were in the Julian Center. Which is a local women's shelter. Yes. Right. Um, the, everything before that was focused on how to fix me. Um, because there must be something wrong with me because my parents were abusive and I wasn't responding the way they felt I should respond. Mm -hmm. um, and what it really came down to is I wasn't a popular kid in school, um, mainly because of my sister. And I owe a lot of the credit to my sister, believe it or not. Um, her, I don't know how to put this politically correctly, but her um, openness to the other gender, okay. <laughs> um, you know, really made it impossible for me to date really anybody at our high school. And it is funny as uh, we've gone through this process, we'd be friends and like, hey, do you remember uh, Amanda? And they're like, no, I have no idea. And then when I tell you about, hey, I ran into so-and-so, you're like, I have no idea who that is. It's like you weren't there. Like, I remembered you because I had a crush on you in 11th grade in art <laughs> class. So I remembered you, and that's why we were Facebook friends, but nobody else does. So. You know, they, they all remember my sister, though, sometimes intimately well. But they, <laughs> they all remember my sister. And uh, believe me, after your first few dates, when you get out on them, just starting to date, you find out that, oh, but your sister would go ahead and go all the way. Right. You know, And that's why they're dating you. It really makes you not want to even join that realm. Right. So I had the, which turned out to be a good thing for me because it gave me time to really develop who I am. And I was really happy with who I become by the time I was going to college and mm -hmm. felt like I was carving out my own path and doing my own thing. Um, and, you know, even my family will tell you, I was just that tough girl that, you know, nothing stopped me if I decided I was gonna do something. Absolutely, you, uh, one of your best uh, features as a person is your tenacity. You don't ever give up, and I think that's, that's largely why you and your kids today are thriving. So all this does have a happy ending, um, but obviously it's hard to get there. And that's just, I guess that's life. You go through difficulties and you learn and grow and eventually thrive if you do the right things. Um, what? So what would you say that the key to that self-acceptance is? I mean, you, you eventually, it's still, you know, even though you knew yourself, you eventually got into to rough situations. Um, but if you're, I guess part of what we've talked about is just learning self-esteem, learning to accept yourself and not worry about what society has laid out for you. I think more importantly is learning that you don't have to adhere to societal roles. I mean, because my whole thing when I was married was trying to become what I should be as a wife. Um, and that's just not true. And that's not how I approach dating now, certainly. Right. How do you approach it now? Well. This is me, this is what I want, what I'm going for, this is what I need. And if it is, you know, anything other than that, you know, if they want something other than that, we're not a right match. And that's fine. Yeah, and you have been instrumental in teaching me that. And I'm in the best relationship I've ever been in, and I would venture to say that you you probably are too at this point. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, you've, you've come a long way the last two years, and it's, and it's great. And... Uh, I spent the whole day with, with you and the kids recently, and it's just so great to see how far you've come. Um, but there's been a lot of bumps along the way. Um, so, so you leave for the first time, uh, and you go... I, I only left left once. I okay. would say I'm going to leave, and I'd stay with my mom for a couple of days till things calmed down and smoothed over and went back. But when I... So when I separated my check from his account. That first check I got, I took the day off. I bought a vehicle, because I wasn't allowed to take any of the three vehicles we already had. Mm -hmm. I bought a vehicle. I packed whatever clothes, the portable crib for my daughter, her car seat, whatever I could fit of my children's into that car. And my children, um, this is after he refused to leave the house. And I drove away, and I never, ever drove back. Okay. So then what happens in the story? I went to my mom's. Um, I asked her for us to stay there, and she refused. Okay. 
Um, she said I could temporarily till I went back there. She invited him over several times. It was almost Christmas time at that point. And she wanted to invite him to family Christmas. And I just really dug my heels in and I said, you can invite him to family Christmas, that's fine, but the kids and I won't be here. Yeah, it, 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 it took your mom a while to get it. It took everybody a while to get it. I mean, at that point in time, I didn't really know how abused we had been. Mm -hmm. Because the whole time I'm being told this is normal, this is what marriage is. Right. And then I get to the point where I say, well, then I, I don't want to be buried. Right. You know, if this is normal, if this is what it is, then I don't want it. So talk about that emotional unfolding where you kind of, once you initially leave, what are some of the things that you go through and how do you kind of deal with that stuff? Um, well, I'd like to say that I shed a tear over losing him, but I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, at every turn of the bend, he never ceased to amaze me from, you know, this brand new car, brand new used car that I just um, bought breaking down left and right because it's a used vehicle from a shady dealership mm -hmm. because that's what I could do last right. minute, you know, and for him to be there at every turn of the bend saying, well, I'll fix your car if you sleep with me or if you leave your underwear with me, I'll, you know, I'll fix this or I'll come rescue you off the side of the road. Or, hey, I know that my, you know, infant child is stranded on the side of the highway, but I'm not going to come and pick her up or help you at all unless you give me a blowjob. Wow. You know? So I had absolutely no reason to ever once say, I've made the wrong decision. Sure. So you were still connected to him in some way after you left? Yes. We were connected through my daughter. My son never wanted to see him again, and that was fine. Um, he didn't want to see my son either. And I'll tell you what, ladies, it says a lot about a person if they can't get along with a child. Sorry, I was taking a drink and I almost <laughs> spit it out, but you're right, yeah. <laughs> Dogs and kids, if they don't like you, uh, yeah. you got a problem. Well, and it's not so much the kid liking you either, but I mean, you can tell, you can tell if you really take the time when it's a facade. They're happy to play with your kid at first, but the, it, the difference is playing with them and investing in them. Do they really listen to your kid when your kid's talking? Do they really try to figure out what your two-year-old is saying? Mm -hmm. You know, or or any two-year-old for that matter. Or do they just kind of blow them off and shrug because they can't understand it? Right. So you're you're at your mom's at this point, and then where do you go from there? Um, we were there for six months. I saved up money. I decided to move out. I was looking at places near where my mom lived when um, my daughter's father said, "Hey, you know, I really miss my daughter." I'd like to be a part of her life every day. Mm -hmm. I know that I was terrible to you guys. I know that I screwed up. I just want to have a chance to be a good dad to her. Will you please move back up here? I'll help you with Michael. I know you can't do it alone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll help you. We'll, we'll get through this. That way I can co-parent my child. Right. And like a sucker, I said, yeah, sure, I'll move back up there. So after all you've been through, why did you believe him? I just wanted that perfect thing for my daughter. Yeah. I wanted her to have both parents. It is so, it is so common. I mean, it, mothers, definitely more than fathers, uh, just want whatever is best for their kids, even if it comes at the expense of themselves. I think a lot of, of your tale is, tale implies that this isn't true, but a lot of what your story entails is, uh, you know, doing what is best for your kids and not right for you ends up putting you into trouble, I think. It does, yes. Um, a lot of my decisions that were made to give my, well, and it's not even what's best for my kids, and I think that's a, a big part of what we think about, too, um, because we think about what's best in terms of what's culturally normal and culturally accepted as being best. Right. Um, so, my, my, ex is someone who never played with my son after the first three years of marriage, who locked him in a room, who didn't feed my newborn daughter, um, who, you know, could barely even get my son off the bus and into the house without having issues, who could never cook dinner. Um, not once in our year of marriage did he ever cook dinner. He could never remember birthdays or holidays or special occasions. He never took anybody to the park. He wouldn't go on family outings with us. You know, when you look at that and you say, yeah, my daughter deserves a father, and 
her father to be proud of her life. She absolutely does. But she doesn't deserve that kind of father. She deserves right. a better one. Yeah. So you move close. We moved close. He helped find a place that was two streets over from where we lived as a married family and where he still lived. Um, it was far enough away that he would have had to actually drive the wrong direction to leave to come by my house. So I felt pretty confident that, you know, he wouldn't just be driving past me and passing on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. But close enough that as our daughter grew, she could go back and forth between the houses on a nightly basis. She could visit with him every day before she came home if we wanted to. Right. It gave a lot of flexibility to her being able to have the best of both worlds. Right. So what ended up happening? Um, what was the reality in instead of the, the fairy tale that you had concocted in your mind? The reality is it was his way of keeping dibs on us so that he could manipulate and continue to control us. Mm -hmm. um, he actually, as we were progressing to move, um, he actually got my son kicked out of the school district because he told him that we were no longer in that district, even though he knew that we were going up there. So my son had to have a split year of four months in a different school corporation before we moved back up. Wow. Um, and at that point, it was too late to even back out because the lease was signed. So what other ways did he use that situation to his advantage? Um, it, when I did need help, and I rarely did need help with getting um, my son off the bus, um, I ended up having to have surgery, and he was supposed to get my son off the bus for me because I had a doctor's appointment, and he did. And when I got home and, and got both my daughter and son picked up from him, he told me that the only way he was going to continue to help me is if I paid him in blowjobs every time. Wow. Um, Obviously, you did not. No, I didn't. I, I kicked him out of my house. And he actually busted my door down that night mm. when I was trying to kick him out of my house. I kept asking him to leave. I went to shut the door, and he busted it open. He says he kicked it with his foot, according to the police records. Um, but he, he busted the side of the hinge where it attaches, and it hit me, and I had a big bruise on my leg. And it just about took out our daughter, who was standing on that side of me. If it hadn't hit my leg, it would have hit her. Mm. So... Uh continually not respecting your property is your property no definitely not um, we went from that to when he dropped started dropping her off at my place because then he didn't want me to pick her up from his place he wanted to bring her over to my place right and every time he did he would steal something um, my underwear from the dirty clothes he would habitually keep my daughter's clothing um, he would lock himself inside, tell me he had to use my bathroom, lock himself inside my bathroom and then masturbate so that there was cum on my shower curtain or my hand towels or the mirror in my bathroom. It was really, really nasty. What is the point of that? I, I don't understand it. He'd even steal my phone um, and try to masturbate on my phone. Um, it's... It's really messed up. And, and before that, we tried to finish out our contracts with phones. And because we were obviously on a married contract still, and we ended up not being able to fill that out because he became so jealous when I received work phone calls that he blocked people from being able to call me. Oh, wow. And th this is not while you're married. This is while you have been this divorced. This while we're separated. Yes. Right. So this you... is pending divorce. Right. Um, and this is like a year after you had left, correct? I mean, this is... This is going on a year after. Okay, so so as time progresses, I mean, does that does his behavior go from, I mean, and, and you've told me so often, like, listen, I don't understand situations like that. You don't try to understand mental illness because you just, you are a rational person, and so you can't break down and understand that you're rational. No, when we, my daughter started having severe, really severe cases of diaper rash, and she was potty trained. So it was very alarming that she was having these, and I was taking her to the doctor, and they were trying to figure out why, and they were doing all sorts of tests. Um, and eventually, when we got to the point that somebody did step in and was actually able to help, um, you know, one of the things they said to me, which really put everything in perspective, was, and it was a victim's advocate that said this, she said, we can't understand what sick, demented people do. We can only understand what rational, loving people do. Right. And it's very true because it's the first time that I identified in my head that he is sick. Yeah. 
what had you thought before? You know, uh, until then, even even with what we've gone through, you know, my mom and others that I told said, oh, you're probably just blowing it out of proportion. You're taking it too personal because you had a, you know, intense relationship with him. You were married to him. You're just taking it too personally, and it's not as bad as what you're making it seem. Mm-hmm. Okay. So then, what... What what's so does he continue to escalate what at he does. That point? Um, eventually I discover I actually find him hiding behind my bedroom window one night mm. and the police catch him when I call the police and he has my daughter, our daughter, and she is at his house alone while he's doing this. And she's roughly what age? She's less than two. Okay. So she's alone for five hours. Yes. While he is outside of your window. Yes. And the police catch him and they ask him why he's there. And he says he knows it's a poor decision. He knows he shouldn't be there. But he can't help himself. And he just keeps thinking if he could just kill me, he would be normal again. And so they let him go home to my daughter. They didn't arrest him? No. They didn't call CPS. They sent him home. They didn't do anything? No. They sent him home. They said, you can't leave your daughter home alone. That's a felony. You need to go home to her. And, and they, they sent him home. And they didn't arrest him for that? No. They didn't even contact CPS for that. So did they take a police report of this? They were supposed to write a police report, but they did not. Okay. So then what does that trigger in you? I mean, what is that? What chain of events does that set off for you? Well, that, that officer, the one credit to that officer, is that he did convince me that my ex is dangerous, mm -hmm. which is something I felt but had been consistently told I'm making it too big of a deal and I'm blowing it out of proportion. Um, this officer, and it really only took one person telling me that they see it too, for me to say, yeah, I'm right, he's dangerous. So... You hadn't called the police. There hadn't been a reason, really, to call the police up and up until that point. And this is the first time you've called the police. This, this was the, the first time I called the police. There okay. were many reasons that I could have called him: busting my door open and bruising me. All of those things could have been called. Sure. Him trespassing on my property. You know, being there when he shouldn't be there. Right. Stealing my property. I mean, I could have called all those times, but every time I reached out to my family for help and advice, I was told. I'm making it into too big of a deal. Right, your support system had let you down consistently, and you didn't—you didn't even realize it. Well, it's back to those, you know. They don't—they don't know. I mean, they—they're back to thinking, you know, it's romantic that they killed each other, you know, that they killed themselves right. and killed one another. So this police officer, um, he basically outlines. I'm—I'm I'm guessing it's a he outlines that. Listen, this is a problem. This person is. Dangerous. Seriously dangerous. They said, go down, get a protective order. I think they're open 24 hours. You should go down tonight if you can. You may not want to stay at your house for the next few days. Wow. Okay. So, and while I'm talking to the police officer, um, my ex is continuously blowing up my phone in front of the police officer. And he tells me at one point that he can no longer keep our daughter that night and I need to come get her immediately. So the police officer decides that they're gonna escort me over to get her. So I need to wait for his partner because they can't do any escorts without two of them. Right. Um, so well, I'm waiting for his partner and my ex is so impatient to the point that he decides to walk my daughter around to me and it's less than 20 degrees outside. She has no coat on, she's in her jammies. And the police officer makes remark of, oh hey, we should call CPS because that right there alone is something else that they would, you know, they would charge him with neglect for. And the other officer says, oh no, let's give him a break. He doesn't have any priors. He's probably just having a rough time with this. Okay. I actually know one of the police officers. Um, I actually know the police officer that told you he was dangerous uh, via Facebook. And y you... It's kind of funny. My current boyfriend went to high school with him. Really? Yes. <laughs> um, he, uh, you were the subject uh, about a year ago in an article on in Nuvo for uh, domestic violence. The, this story was kind of told in that, if you want to look it up, it's Nuvo blaming the victim. And when that came out... I have a different name in that, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
uh, in that article, um, so it came out and, and I posted it and he got a hold of me. And so we talked and he said, listen, to defend myself, I did take a police report and I filed a police report, but we were switching softwares at the time and the database got erased and so no police report was ever filed. Can I correct that? Sure. So we go to court for this, um, for the, the hearing to, for the protective order and it's granted for me and my children are taken off of it because the police report has not been filed. Right. And they checked the old database and the new database and I have a letter stating the date that it was checked which was exactly 14 days after the incident that it was never entered into either database. Okay. After that hearing, because the, the judge couldn't even see that there had been an incident because there was no police report, after that hearing, it took my attorney 31 days to get the officer to actually write the police report and file it, and it's now on file. Mm, okay. So, the lack of police report for whichever, you know, whichever case, either way, there was no police report. Um, either by uh, either way the court system or the police department screwed up and either way that's unacceptable well it and started with the police department because CPS should have been contacted immediately that night yeah so what did that cost you and your family what was the fallout from that not being done correctly my daughter had con to continue to see him she was not on the protective order um, my son was not on the protective order, and since they went to the same daycare, that meant my son was present every time he picked up or dropped off my daughter. Right. Um, which was terrifying to my son. Um, meanwhile, my ex feeling that he'd gotten away with it continued to go outside my window. How long do you think that he was actually stalking you outside of your window? From the first time that I caught him to the time that we actually left and never came back it was seven and a half months wow what did it finally take for you to get the police to listen um i i don't know that the police ever did listen every time i would call i would hear things like well what did you do to him to make him stand outside your window or i would call friends that i had in the area to come over um and uh, there was a guy that I was dating because we've been apart at that point for two and a half years that I just started dating. And I would call him because I knew he carried a gun to come and stay in the living room when I heard noises. And they would say things like, well, why don't you just move on to some other guy and just have him be the parents of your kids? You know, why are you even bothering this poor guy? Um, Another police officer said one of the most stunning things I've ever heard uh, a ever said to a victim of domestic violence, what did he say to you? He told me to shake my boobs at the window and get him to stay longer so they could catch him. Right. So it is your responsibility to violate your personhood and do something that you find morally reprehensible, knowing to you. To help the police do their job. To help the police do their job, as opposed to them taking your word for it. Uh, well, they even saw the footprints on the side and in the back, too, but they couldn't they couldn't be certain that they were his, and this is after the protective order was granted. Um, so they were not willing to make an arrest. One of them actually told me that they were not going to allow me to harass him through my protective order. How many police officers? Do, how many police officers do you think that you talked to over what span? Um, well, it was the main two that came out most of the time, um, but I think there was a total of about six, and. Finally, I remember saying to them, so what do I have to do to make you take this seriously? Because I'm scared. And they said, well, if you have proof. I said, what kind of proof? Walk me through this. And basically they said, you know, you can't just take a picture. You have to establish that this is the location, number one. Number two, you have to have a time and date stamp and not just your cell phone, like an actual real time and date stamp on there that you can't vary just from taking the picture. Um, and they said, and then, then we can do something. And every time I asked for a police report and every time they told me it was not necessary. Okay. So I bought a game camera that hunters use to track their prey, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's an infrared system that I hung on the porch so it was disguised and he couldn't see it. Um, and it 
had a time and date stamp and it had a GPS location tracker. I spent about $500 on this camera. Mm -hmm. um, but it GPS pinpointed the location, you know, with longitude and latitude as well as the address of where it was, mm -hmm. plus the date and time. And what did it net? Uh, it, it took lots of pictures of him outside my window. Okay. And then what did you do with those photos? Uh, the first time I got photos, I called the police. The police. I met with them. I showed them to them. And they said, ma'am, I'm very sorry. I do believe you're in danger, but I can't do anything with these photographs. Was that, uh, did you call the number? I mean, who, who, who did you talk to specifically? Um, it was whatever police officer was on duty for that district in the morning. Okay, so you went into the district. No, I called them out to my house. Okay. So then... I called 911. Okay, and then what? Um, they said, we can't do anything with this without a warrant, and I don't see any police reports in the past showing that this has been an issue. So I do see your, that you have a protective order, but I don't see that this was the cause of it because the police report still hadn't shown up. And thus begins, for the, well, for the second time, a long line of government officials looking at you and saying, I'm very sorry for what's happened. Clearly there's something going on here, but I can't just, I, I just can't help you. Yeah, you're in danger, but I can't help you. Yeah. And over the, the span of four years now, that has been the case. Um, and yes. We don't have a government, we have a system of referrals. Right. So, so you, uh, and are you cold? Do you, okay, all right. I have the, the air on is at 67 and I'm, I feel great, but you seem cold. Well, I'm always cold. <laughs> <laughs> so then you, you have these photos and the police won't do anything. So then, I mean, what is your reaction at that point? Um, I feel pretty defeated. I keep the camera up, I come up with a plan, um, I start noticing him driving past me with this girl that he's supposedly dating at the time, following my car to and from places, I start documenting it all, taking pictures, um, writing in a journal what's happening, calling just to have the 911 report there when he's following me, that they can at least pull some sort of record that I'm attempting to get it documented. Mm -hmm. I start asking every police officer that comes out for their badge number. Um, he starts taking my daughter on days that is not his visitation days and just keeping her. He took my son one time for two days when he has no rights to him and just kept him. I didn't know when I would get him back. Wow. Um, through all of this, CPS is not called and the police refuse to do anything because they say it's a civil matter and our divorce was still pending in court. Okay. So... Uh, Give me give me some context of time. So from the first, you you said it was. Um... So we stayed um, we stayed in that rental for almost a year, and it was about seven months from when I first left till we moved in there. So we're talking within the first two years of me leaving. And, and you you notice how long in, but he had probably been outside of your window the entire time that. Much longer. You had been, yes. yeah, before there, you caught him. There was stuff he would say to me that I would think, how on earth could he know that I discussed that with somebody else? Um, and I would have game nights, and I always had a New Year's Eve party at my place, a uh, kid-friendly New Year's Eve party at my place, where um, parents could bring their kids and either leave them so they could go out, which we had a couple do that, mm -hmm. or most of them chose to stay because they were single parents as well, and the kids could play and we could talk and play games and it was a, a fun get together. Right. And he would tell me about conversations that happened during that and it, I couldn't figure out how he knew and I thought maybe I told him about the conversation and I don't remember it. Right. You, you don't think that there's any, like your brain at that point isn't thinking what the obvious might be. Looking back it seems simple but your brain is just thinking well I must be the problem. I was so cautious not to make it into a bigger deal than what it was because that's what I kept hearing. Right. That I kept telling myself, no, there's no way that could be possible. And so much of domestic violence surrounds, uh, there's a concept called gaslighting, which essentially is the 
the abuser makes the uh, emotionally manipulates and makes the person feel like they're the crazy one like there is if, if it comes from a term from an old movie but look up gaslighting and maybe that'll click and that'll that'll help you uh, if you're a man or a woman uh, and obviously there are domestic incidents on on both sides uh, understand the term gaslighting because people do it to you all the time and you don't realize it they're making you feel like you're the crazy one you're the bad one when in reality it's them manipulating you you know you're the one that is is you're not crazy I'm not yeah. an overreactor I, I never right. have been and a lot of what I think it, wow Mittens is getting real friendly I apologize she just curled up and started hanging out if you're watching the video you can see it um Mitt, come on now <laughs> so yeah, there. We don't. We don't want to think. Our, our think. Our brains don't immediately go. Well, it's. It's. You know. Maybe I did something. It's not. They're not the crazy one. Especially if you grow up with low self esteem, which I think is most people more than. You know. I don't think most people are emotionally stable. I think most people need therapy and and to read self esteem by Matthew McKay, but or a little Brene Brown. Check her out. Um, I wish I could do my own radio show, but my cat's butt is in my face. Um, so, so you go through this period of time, and and you're there in that rental for one year. Just about one year. Just I had to break the lease a little early. Okay, so let's talk about that. You. So the last set of photographs I was able to catch on the game camera, he brought and left a crowbar and a piece of string. Um, like heavy duty galvanized metal string mm -hmm. that um, that was a very very scary morning for me seeing those on the pictures seeing him leave them seeing them still outside my window yeah um, I called the police and once again they would not write even a report it doesn't take much to deduce that he was going to pry your window open and then strangle you with it no especially since he had told the other officer if he could have just killed me he would have been okay um, right so it was a, a pretty horrifying thing to see and then the other aspect of that is you know trying not to let my children feel scared yeah and that i mean that was an issue that was really tough um yes, i i don't think i slept for months i mm -hmm. used to sit in the there was two outside windows in my bedroom i took the smaller one and my children were still young enough at the time that they could share a bedroom mm -hmm. Um, so I took the smaller one so they could have the larger one and that was the corner between those two windows was the only place he couldn't see me from either window mm -hmm. so at night I would sit awake against that corner did you did you ever catch him looking in at you did you see yes. him yes um, we were playing um, one night we were playing games and it was a night that he had my daughter and my son had gone to bed and I had about four or five friends that lived pretty close to there, and I kind of filled them in briefly on what was happening, nothing extreme, mm -hmm. but that I didn't feel comfortable sleeping. So they offered to bring some board games over, which is one of my favorite pastimes, and stay up with me and play board games to take my mind off of it, right. hoping it would relax me to the point that I could actually drift off to sleep. Yeah. Um, we're in the middle of playing a game, and I look over to the side of the window, and I see his face smashed against my window and I screamed bloody murder and everybody else saw it too right no no <laughs> um, they all looked up about the time that I screamed and he was gone I mean mm. he heard me and he he ran yeah um, but the the game cam actually has the pictures of him and the pictures of him running away right and it matches the same time frame that everybody told the police they heard me scream and right um, but still no police report okay so you finally get to a point where it's clear he's escalating from just stalking you to now hunting you. Yeah, the, the crowbar and the wire was my, I've got to make somebody do something. I took, this was the only day I'd taken off of work during all this. Um, I missed a lot of time in the morning, like that I came in late because I had to file police reports, but I actually took the full day off. Um, the day after that, and I went downtown, and I went down to the, if you go down in the city county building to the basement, that's where they get the protective orders, 
and they told me, well, you can file a protective order violation, but these pictures are not admissible in court because there is not a police report that goes with it. Right. And your court date for this hearing will be set out six months. Okay. So that means I would have to stay in the current situation for another six months. Yeah. And to have photos that are not admissible because there's no police report. <laughs> okay. So I'm the basket case at that point. Yeah. Right now I still can't even talk about it. But I'm crying and I'm coming up the stairs. And this security sheriff, um, well, a sheriff who's being a security officer at the time, letting people in and out of the courtroom, says, what's wrong? You look really upset. And I just show him the pictures and I start telling him what's going on. And he's just shocked. Yeah. I mean, he was utterly amazed and he can't figure it out. And he says, come in, come into the sheriff's department with me. He calls somebody over to cover his security station. And he starts writing up a report for every single set of pictures. Mm. And his supervisor comes over, asks him what he's doing. And he tells him. His supervisor makes a call into IMPD, um, who has been the people that have been coming out every time these pictures are there. And he pulls the 911 calls to see that I have reported it, that IP IMPD has done the runs. And when he comes back after about a half an hour, 45 minutes of being on phone calls, he orders the officer who is helping me to stop writing a report, not to help me, and tells me, ma'am, I'm very sorry, you're in a lot of danger, but this is not our district. You're gonna to have to go through IMPD. Yeah, so here in Marion County, uh, there used to be uh, the Sheriff's Department and the Police Department were two entities and then Ten years ago, they were combined into one ent entity, and that gave the sheriff too much power, so the mayor, uh, eight years ago, separated the two, and so now there's two entities again, and the sheriff's department, uh, which whom she was talking to, uh, who guards the courthouse, was uh, has some policing powers, but not, I mean, that's not their main focus. Their main focus is, you know, guarding the courthouse, prisoners, anything after you've been convicted. Anything before you've been convicted, really, the jurisdiction is of the police department, who has consistently let her down. She finally finds someone in the uh, in the in the security infrastructure that is willing to talk to her and help her, and they're ordered to stop. I mean, at that point, you've got to be just. I mean, how do you feel? At that Defeated. Point? Yeah. So. Like my tomb was sealed. Yeah that essentially the people that are you have relied on to protect you have failed you and your kids and there's nothing else left to do i just kept thinking my dad is a well was he's passed away now he was a you know medaled and honored soldier for this country mm -hmm. and i kept thinking about how mad he would be to know that this is what he fought to protect Right. So you then leave, I, and what, what do you do then? I was standing very dazedly outside of the court, city county building, the courthouse, because I had no idea where to go, no idea what to do. And the um, officer who had started to write up a police report and was ordered not to is really, you know, my heroine in mm -hmm. this, this whole ordeal. Your hero, not your heroine. Yeah, my hero. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's neither a female nor is he a an opiate. Uh. <laughs> uh, but he's really my hero in this whole ordeal. He came out and he said, um, he said, look, I'm really sorry about that. I can't stay here very long. But he gave me, um, he said, you need to go see a victim's advocate. The you know main prosecutor's office is just down the block here. I would start there. He said, just start somewhere. Don't give up. Yeah. So I went over to the office that he told me to find, and I'm directionally challenged to put it in a very <laughs> nice way. You are. I've never met anyone who had less <laughs> facial skills than you. Yeah, I think. Um, I think my key phrase is, I think I've been lost here before. <laughs> <laughs> I get a call once a week at least. Used to be once a day, but she has a boyfriend now, so it's once a week. No, when actually, it's gotten better. <laughs> um, but I, I oh, I've been lost here before. 
Yeah, once once I realize that, I have a good idea of figuring out that I'll eventually find myself. <laughs> <laughs> Not after a couple hours. Yeah. So his very vague directions are, it's within this block, and it's a brick building. <laughs> Which, that's all brick buildings right there. And so I just start going in door to door, every single brick building within that block. And it turns out it's the next block over. Um, finally, somebody is very helpful to say, oh, no, it's it's across the street over there in that block. <laughs> right. And so I start going door to door in that block, just looking for this building. And I'm probably giving him way less credit. I'm sure he probably gave me more information than what I remembered in my distress right. period as to finding this building. Um, but that's what was going through my head as I'm looking. It's the brick building in this block. So mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I get over there, and I tell the front desk lady after I finally find the building what's going on and I show her the pictures and I say I was told by the sheriff's department that I should come talk to you since I can't get anyone to write me a police report that I need to meet with one of your victim's advocates so I wait for about an hour the victim's advocate comes out and says she looks at the pictures and she listens to me for about 15 minutes and she says you really do need help you really are out of our district and I have a dental appointment so I'm just not going to be able to address this right now. And leaves. The victim's advocate is the person who is designed to help victims of domestic violence. Their, their key goal is to make sure that they are protected, safe, and have the, have the government support that they need to obtain the necessary... And whatever effectiveness they had is no longer because Governor Mike Pence recently, about a year ago, in the last last year's legislative session, signed a bill that defunded uh, programs for domestic violence and basically no county in the state of Indiana, including Marion County, now has a victim advocate. Well, and That position no longer exists. So that person that you went to talk to wouldn't even be there today which they didn't help me at all anyways. Right. <laughs> um, so she had a dental appointment. She could not help. Um, and she left, and I started crying. And at that point, an attorney walked by, just a random attorney. And they said, oh, no, what's wrong? You know, can we help? And I told them, and they said, I can't help you. I don't deal with this sort of thing. And the reason you're probably not getting any help is because you already have a protective order. But the problem is a protective order is just a piece of paper. Mm -hmm. They said that's all a protective order is in our government system. Right. It's nothing more than a piece of paper. It's a, it's a paper trail and that's it. Like and a I police said, report. said, well, what good does it do? And she said, so that when he kills you, they can prosecute him. I said, when he kills me? And that was the first time that anybody actually told me my statistics of survival. Which were? 10%. 90% of women who are harassed and stalked and who have their, 90% of women who are harassed and stalked end up dead. 100% um, of the time, when somebody has stolen your underwear, it leads to a sex crime. Hmm. As you have told me previously, there's two types of domestic violence. There is the type that gets drunk, can't control their emotions, and makes a mistake, but would never do that under sober conditions yes. but then there are there's the other more dangerous fatal type of domestic violence which is like a drain essentially if you, you remember those those big things that you used to see for the United Way that would uh, you put a, a nickel or a dime in it and then it would circle around and roll down into the hole that eventually you start at one place and then it spirals and spirals and spirals until it finally becomes fatal. One or both of you end up dead. Right. So typically just the one, mm -hmm. but it's a very, very low success rate to keep your life when yeah. you're being stalked. And then I learned that to prosecute a stalker um, is the hardest case a prosecutor has to face. Why is that? because it's the hardest thing to prove and it's the hardest thing to get a jury to relate to and understand the fear and danger that goes into it because there's no bruising there's no bloodshed there's no photo evidence of somebody being hurt where someone would look at it and say oh my gosh i feel so bad for them yeah okay because it's hard for people to relate to that emotion they don't know what it's like to be hunted right 
So they certainly know what it's like to skin their knee or to have a cut or to break a bone. Right, but they don't understand beaten prey. No. So is there a legal standard? I'm sorry, mittens. My cat literally will not get up out of my face. I'm about to lock him in the other room. Um, is there a legal standard for stalking, menacing, whatever these charges are called in your local area? I mean, is there, what does it take to, to even get a, obviously it's clearly difficult to get a police report. Yeah. Uh, and then you've got to convince the police to, to take action to arrest. You have to convince them it's not a civil matter. Which means what? Um, well, so there's, there's like laws that the police have that are black and white. And then there's laws that like the family court makes and the protective court makes that are considered civil matters, such as okay. because you have a protective order, he's only supposed to get your daughter on these certain days. He decides, screw the protective order, screw when he's supposed to get her and fix her up when he's not supposed to. The police say, I'm not gonna touch that. Yes, eventually it could be a crime as far as your child is concerned. Your child could be a victim here because he's doing this, but we can't really dive into it or look at it or address it because this has to do with a civil matter. So the yeah, the, they have no enforcement over civil issues. No. Only the court does. So you have to get the court to take the matter up again. Yes. Uh, and if you uh, and we'll talk about the civil and criminal courts later on because you, if you are if your jaw is dropping now, trust me, it's only going to get far more shocking once we get to the courts. We're not even to the arrests yet. Um, so, so you, what is, so what is the standard? I mean, you once told me that it's like three, you have to have three documented cases to even be arrested and then you have to have a prosecutor take it up? Um, not to be arrested, but to even apply for a protective order, you have to have three documented cases of abuse to be honored that. You'll get a temporary one if you don't have the three because the courts always want to err on the side of caution. But then when you actually go before a judge to make it a permanent protective order, and this mm -hmm. is what a lot of people don't understand, so you get this temporary protective order until your court case. Right. Um, and then you have to go to the court case to keep that protective order. That's why so many people have a protective order and it doesn't stand up and it doesn't go on their per permanent record. Um, but you have to have three documented cases of abuse okay. to keep that protective order. You mm -hmm. have to prove that it is a pattern or a cycle. It can't just be a one-time thing. Okay. You know, unless it's, my understanding is it can happen if it's really, really severe. Right. Um, but that's like beating you within a half inch of your life or killing somebody in front of you that was in the way. Then they will oftentimes insert that in, but it's inserted criminally and not through the civil court at that point. Okay. So to actually keep a civil protective order, you have to have at least three documented cases that you can prove happen beyond a shadow of a doubt of abuse. Okay. So so you, you talk to this attorney and she basically tells you your odds at this point are 10%. 10% survival. And she gives me the phone number for a prosecutor's office, actually three prosecutor's offices. She took the time out to go back to her office and look up. I mean, this is... And this is the pattern. So we've got two people that go above and beyond what their duty actually is mm -hmm. because they care. And they do more help than, you know, even imaginable. Yeah, well, what what we discovered in, and I don't, I, I don't, I'm sure you didn't, you don't listen to the podcast, nor did you hear episode 91 with my friend Woody, who uh, had a daughter who was arrested for drugs. Uh, she was given 16 years. You did tell me. I told you about that because you and I talk about how absolutely unbelievable it is that she gets 16 years for selling three or four pills yeah. and that yet your your ex still walks free and has barely served any jail time. Um, and continues to violate. Yeah. And it, there were a hundred government officials that came into contact with Rachel over the course of months that could clearly see that she was dying, that she had a medical issue that was not being taken care of properly. And nobody would get in touch with Woody, nobody would help Woody find his daughter. They had lost her, they issued, uh, for a woman who couldn't walk, at one point issued a uh, statement that she had escaped because they lost her in the system. And out of the 100 people, one person had enough humanity and empathy to call Woody and say, your daughter's here, you need to come see her, she doesn't have much longer. And when I talk to people, uh, 
because of my place uh, as a public libertarian, uh, where I publicly declare that the government is a giant waste of time and resources, you hear stories like this, and the thing that I consistently hear in in these stories is, I came into I came into contact with so many government officials, and nobody cared, nobody would help, nobody wanted to put their own neck out. But then there was one person who did, and that changed everything. That made a difference. And in your case, it, it was, you know, a sheriff, but then there was also this lawyer who's not part of the government, technically, yeah. you know, and who really, the, the private sector is what has helped you more than, than the public sector. The public sector has actually put you in more danger, and... I don't know that the private sector has helped all that much either. I think it's sure. just, you know, I think it's, and so through talking to the sheriff that helped me, he explained to me that a lot of police officers don't remember or realize that when they take an oath to be a police officer or a sheriff, they, they pledge to be a public servant. Right. And they instead feel this entitlement that comes from it, and they feel like they are entitled to be above everyone else and to take these decisions and make these decisions in their own hands. The first mm. officer made the decision to let him go when that wasn't his decision to make. Yeah. That was a judge and jury's decision to decide whether he was guilty or innocent. Yep. He was violating the law. He should have arrested him. Yes. And CPS should have been called. Yeah. So, and what they are doing, and they don't realize they're doing, is they are putting innocent lives in jeopardy when they decide that they can play, you know, judge and jury by themselves. So, and listen, you are not an anti-government radical by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you were, uh, you grew up in a military family. You and you have passed this tradition on to your son are the most rule-following people I have ever met. In your, I mean, if there's you a don't speak. <laughs> yeah, if there is a rule, we follow it, and if there is a law, we follow it. Yes, uh, we are law-abiding citizens. And you and I constantly go back and forth because I'm like, it's a law. Who cares? It's a rule. It's meant to be broken. And you're like, don't teach that to my children. No. Um, and I, you're I you're think, progressive that voted for Obama too. I mean, you're yes, not. Yeah. Yes. I, I mean, I think laws have a great place in society. I mean, there are little bits of your freedom that you give up to ensure your safety and your liberty. The problem is, is when you're giving up your freedom and your safety and your liberties and your beliefs are not being secured. Mm -hmm. That's the breakdown in government, and that is what I'm seeing happening more and more uh, here in the United States. And it's it's sad because this country is going downhill, and with the current running people we have, it doesn't look like it's going to get better. Yep. A few more years, I'll have you firmly in the libertarian camp, I'm sure. Um, I'll be a Canadian. <laughs> <laughs> so you, uh, so you finally leave. And you, this is kind of, you're now at a point where it's clear you're not going to get help from the police. That you're on your own and you've got to fight on your own. I've got to contact the prosecutor's office myself without a police report. See right. See if there's anything they can do. What happens there? Um, I'm told that I'll receive a call back within a few weeks. Did that call ever come? Well, eventually it does, but the more immediate issue is I can't go home. Right. He's left a... You know, crowbar and a wire outside my window last night. All of this discussion over the last 20, 30 minutes has been in the span of one one day. One day. Right. This and so, one day. so now we, we're, we're going to expand the timeline a little bit. Uh, so now we get to a point where you're in immediate danger and yes. you... And I'm told I'll hear back something in a week or so. Right. And so now what do you do? I cried a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, a whole bunch. And then I decided to start contacting news stations. Okay. I called Channel 6, I called Channel 8, and I called Channel 13. Um, Channel 6 called me back pretty quickly. Um, they asked me a bunch of questions. I talked to them on the phone for about an hour and a half. They said they would need to do some verification, and then they would have me in if everything checked out. Um, within, I'd say, an hour of making a phone call to Channel 6 and talking to them, within the hour of hanging up, I received a phone call from that prosecutor's office. So what made you decide to call the media? I couldn't think of anything else to do. Well, I thought, I thought if I'm going to end up dead tonight, everybody's going to know who did it. 
Okay. So you, uh, and I've heard of this, I was just uh, talking to somebody and a family member has cancer and they, the, the treatment is $100,000 uh, with insurance and with insurance it's like, you know, it's very cheap. And so they said, well, what do you do with people who don't have insurance? The guy says, well, I call uh, the news station where I've made a contact and I say, uh, I, I say, hey, it's me again. And then they make a call to the pharmaceutical company and then they give the treatment for almost no cost. <laughs> you know, and it really the media, especially with the investigative slant that has now started to take place in local media, the, it, they really are the light that scatters the cockroaches. So, so you get a call within an hour from the prosecutor. Yes, and then that's not what I expected. I mean, my honest, my goal was, and when I talked to them, I said, here's the thing, I don't think I'm going to live through tonight. Yeah. I want to make sure the right person pays the time for it, and my kids aren't exposed to him after I'm gone. Right. And so what was, the, I mean, did was there an article or a news story or anything, or what kind of happened after that? Um, so once the, once the prosecutor's office called me back, she listened to everything I had to say and said she's already made an appointment for me at a detective's office who this detective I guess was assigned to my case after the very first police officer came out at this point uh, nine ten months previous to that uh-huh um, and had been trying to get in contact with me right and I said well how's he been trying to get in contact with me and they said, oh, well, he's been mailing letters to you and attempting to call the phone number that you listed with the police officer. I said, that's really funny because it's my cell phone and I don't have any missed calls. Not yeah. in nine months. That old gag. Yeah, I tried to call you. You didn't get that? And then they said, well, he mails letters to you. And I said, well, we can go through all of my mail if you want. I haven't received anything. Um, and that's the point when they, they actually did some looking and started looking and found out that my ex had also been stealing my mail. Uh-huh. Okay. which I guess is a normal thing and uh, apparently the detective and the prosecutor's office and the victim's advocate all knew that that was the highest probability of what was happening because in cases of stalking and harassment that's what they do 98% of the time so, so what's, why what's... contact me through the one method they're not going to be able to reach me <laughs> so what, uh, what, what were his charges in that federal crime nothing right okay so that I was told that if if I had wanted him to be caught on the federal charges, I should have come to them earlier. Okay. So then what is the, the outcome of talking to the prosecutor? Um, so I have this meeting with the detective, and it's for later that day. It's for about a half an hour from there. So that really puts me in a scramble to try to figure out where on earth this detective even is, and can I get there in a half an hour. Um, so when I get there, um, I meet with the detective. I... I am such a detailed oriented person that I have a journal with dates in it, I have a calendar with stuff marked, I have the photographs already printed off from the game camera, I have photographs on my camera with non-edited time and date stamps so that it proves it's non-edited. I also have the kiosk from where it was printed put their time and date stamp on there as to when the photo became available on the cloud and I don't understand all the technology but I was assured that through having both of those dates on there it would show that I did not edit the photographs. Yeah and this is this gathering of information the documentation has really been key. That's the only thing that has allowed us to get anywhere. Right so if you're in one of these situations you got to write everything down I mean even if you're in a situation where you know it isn't this catastrophic you're just in a situation where you're in a custody situation and uh, or you're in a legal situation and things just are not going in a way that you think are appropriate you should document everything well not just document you have to assume that nobody's gonna believe you for one because they're right. not and so you have to document and provide proof <sighs> let's just let that sink in nobody the people that are sworn to protect us nobody's gonna believe you no even if you have the photographs you have to have enough compiling information I had letters from uh, we rented a duplex I had letters from the neighbor on the other side about when she heard noises when her dogs would bark 
and I just had her document all those and write to them so that she could swear to the dates that they occurred and they lined up with the photographs I had on the game camera to prove that it was the right location. You know, it, was, it wasn't it was just, oh, you had photographs. It was I had multiple things proving that I'm not making this up. I'm not manufacturing this. Okay, so then what is the outcome of the discussion with the prosecutor? Um, they decide that they're, uh, he has to go meet with, so that was the detective, and he has to go meet with the prosecutor. And they're trying to decide, they send me to speak with the, um, the, the detectives that cover sex crimes. Because at this point we have to decide if we are going to try to convict him on sexual assault. Okay. And that's when I really found out about how hard it is when you're married for you to get a conviction. And the biggest factor in that for me was learning that if, if that trial went before the trial for everything else mm -hmm. and lost, he would likely get off away with doing everything else that he had done because the other one lost forever forever right and it wasn't worth it to me and you had documented evidence from your OBGYN yes right so yes. I mean it was pretty clear cut I had medical documentation that there was sexual abuse going on right so so now you you have this choice because you part of the problem the the limbo that you've been stuck in is that you've had the criminal side and the court family court side the civil and the criminal and there's been this tension because if too many people call CPS if too many people call you know if there's too much evidence if there you know you have all this evidence but at a certain point you can't push too hard on the criminal side because then that makes you look a certain way in the family court. Yeah, if if I didn't win everything I put before the criminal judge, before the criminal courts, if I lost anything that I put before them, in the civil courts, the family courts, that's argued of me making up stuff to make him appear bad in civil court. Right. Okay, so you get the prosecutor's ear and the prosecutor starts to actually listen and build a case. Yes, and let me say, she is awesome. She yeah. is just kick butt awesome. Um, but while this is going on, so that night, and, and, and I haven't actually spoken with the prosecutor at this point, so we leave the detective's office and he's got to get in touch with her and they've got to form a case. Right. Um, so it's not something that happens overnight. This takes months for them to do. Sure. So I'm still going home that night with no immediate safety. Right. And um, I, somebody I worked with as a thank you gave me this really heavy glass gauntlet filled with candy. And I'm not really a big candy eater, but I was looking at that gauntlet and how heavy it was, and it was honestly kind of ugly, this My, crystal gauntlet. And not a gauntlet, but like a statue? No, like a gauntlet, like a cup gauntlet. Oh, a uh, huge, ugly thing. Okay, all right. <laughs> I mean, it, it was it was ugly, but it was very sweet. <laughs> but I'm thinking of how heavy this thing is. I mean, it must have weighed probably 15 pounds. The sucker right. was heavy. And so I decided once I put the kids down that I was going to pull my car up so that it was almost touching the house by their window. Okay. Um, and I was going to leave their window unlocked. Okay. Because he never, ever, ever was at the front of the house. Sure. And but that would make too much sense. I, I mean, mean, that was taking a risk on my part, but that was my escape plan because I knew there was no way we'd be able to get the door open and get out the door um, if he was in the back. The, the entirety of uh, the time that, that we've been close, you have, you have had to develop escape plans, not just for fire, and you've had to teach your children escape plans. You've done it under the guise of fire or national emergency or whatever, but really, you've kind of been planning every single outcome and looking, okay, if this happens, this happens. If he does this, if he does this, we go here, do this, do this, do this. You've built a circle of people that love and care about you around you that, that you've been able to rely on. So it has been, uh, I think that's been an important thing when you're in one of these situations. You've got to think through those things and have those plans in place. And this is really something you should do in life. Like, 
prepare, 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 because once you get to a point where you have an emergency or you get to an overwhelming thing that's going to, that's dangerous or emotionally difficult, if you have built plans and structure of people that can help and talk through this stuff and you're prepared, it's easier to kind of make it through that stuff. Even picking, you know, where do we live? What do we move into is based upon the layout and where will the kids be? Where will I be? How will this work? How will I get us out if he shows up again? Yeah. Um, you know, what, what will happen? Because I know from past experience that I can't fire that gun when I'm looking right at him. Right. Otherwise, he wouldn't be here now. Yeah. So you have set yourself up that night to deal with it. So what happens that night? Um, so that night, I have borrowed somebody's gun, and I have the gauntlet, and I have a plan to get out should he show up, and I'm just hopeful that he doesn't, because he doesn't have our daughter that night, and I'm thinking maybe he's only really doing this on the nights that he takes our daughter, mm -hmm. um, but I see him out my window while I'm getting my pajamas on, and so I load the rifle, and I hold it directly at his face. And when I hear him out there again and see his shadow, I opened the blind so he was staring straight at the rifle. Mm -hmm. And I cocked it. Mm -hmm. And I saw him jump back, and I heard him run. And I thought, I did it. I scared him enough. He's going to leave me alone now. Right. I'm laying in bed. Ten minutes later, I see his face pressed against the glass through the blinds. Um, so I'm holding the gauntlet, and I'm thinking when he pries open the window, I'm going to smash the gauntlet on him, shut the window on top of him, and my kids and I are going to run out through the unlocked window in the front and get in the car. Mm -hmm. um, he's still moving around. It doesn't sound like he's trying to lift open the window. So I'm thinking he's not ready yet. And so I grab the gun again, and I think I'm just going to shoot. I'm just going to shoot him, and and I've been told at that point by the detective's office that because I have a, a private, I, I have a, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Case, my case. protective order. Right. Because I have my protective order, and because the detective put in police reports for me, I have a record of it. So according to the detective, if he is on my property violating that protective order, I can shoot. Okay. I don't have to wait for him to enter the, the, the house. I can shoot if I feel that my life is in jeopardy or my children's life are in jeopardy. So I decide I'm just going to have to shoot. And so this time I open the blinds, I cock the gun again, I point it straight at him, and I've got my hand on the trigger, and I'm, I'm looking at him directly in his face. And he jumps back, and he ducks down, and I hear nothing. And for about two hours, I hear nothing. And, and then I drift off somewhere to sleep along there, and I wake up to hearing this loud scraping sound along the side of the, the side of the bricks. And I didn't even look outside to see if he was there. I ran, grabbed the kids, went out the window, got in the car, I called 911, I said, hey, you know, I've seen him here twice today. He's there. There's a case pending. I know you guys can't do anything, but please at least document that this is what's happening. And I drive away. Um, I spent the entire night driving around in my car just so he couldn't track me. So then what do you do the next day? And the next day I decide I have to find a place to stay. So I go down to the Julian Center. And they tell me, you need help, but we're full. Right. Being a private charity, there's only so many resources to use. There's only so many beds. There's only, you know, and we have, we have this problem here in Indianapolis and you have it in every major city uh, or even in rural areas. There's limited anything in terms of domestic violence help, homeless aid. I mean, there's... That was actually my second trip to the Julian Center, too. Really? I went once before, um, right after the first police officer came out because he suggested I shouldn't stay there mm -hmm. for, for at least a few nights. And I went to the Julian Center and they said, oh, you need help, you need somebody to file a police report and you need to get out of there, but we're full and we just can't help you. Yeah. And so we went back. 
Right. Okay, so you go to the Julian Center, they say they're full. They say they're full again. And at this point in time, I, you know, tell them, I need help. I don't know what to do, but I need help. So they call around to some local shelters, and they find the closest one that has a vacancy is up in Kokomo, Indiana. Mm -hmm. And they're telling me, you know, you'll have to go up there. Since you have your own car, you can drive the kids to school the next day. You can get yourself to work. Um, but they would recommend that I quit my job because it makes it a lot easier getting through the process if I'm not working Why? during that time period. Why is that? Because their idea was to, the, the idea is to completely, I mean, they're set up to completely rehabilitate you. Right. So, I mean, you are a very intelligent and independent person, and that, I mean, not to be mean, but that's just not the case in, in a lot of these cases. No, a lot of them are, you know, the man earns the income, the woman decides to leave, she has nothing. Like our first situation, when I right. left with no money, and I went there then, they would have placed me in a new job, I would have quit my job, I would have stayed there very long term. Um, you know, they would have made sure that I was on food stamps and the kids were on Medicaid, but we already had insurance. Yeah. You know, I, I worked two jobs at that point in time. We, you know, I provided for us already. Yeah, the bulk of their clients are women who literally have nothing, have no support system. They have no idea how to do any of this no stuff. No skills, themselves. no education. Right. A lot of the classes are, how do you manage a monthly budget? Well, I don't need to know how to manage a monthly budget. I've been doing that for years. Right. And, and it also kind of affected you because, well, so you don't get it initially. What what no. happens then? Um, we, I, t I talked to the, actually a couple nights prior to that, the officer, the sheriff officer who um, was ordered not to help me, calls me, apologizes for calling me on my phone number, mm -hmm. and apologizes if he's making me feel uncomfortable, but wanted to just express to me how sorry he was for the way his superior acted and tell me that he filed the reports against what the superior officer said. So he went against his he, officer he, Yeah, he went against the orders and went ahead and filed it. Do you know what happened to him by doing that? Um, he did not end up getting in trouble, luckily. Um, I know that was really a point of contention, but after just in the past couple of years, I went in to say thank you, and his superior approached me and said, you know, you should write a letter about how great my department is and how we really stepped in and helped you out, <laughs> you know, and see if you can get us um, some help, and just write a letter and let them know. And I said, well, I've already written one about officer, um, the officer that helped me, and, you know, I believe he deserves the help, but if I recall correctly, you refuse to help me. And this this is what we find in these cases where we talk about the true cost of government. The, the problem that we talk about on the show all the time is the incentives are perverse in a bureaucracy and in a public system like we have. It is not in this officer's uh, best interest, and humans act in their best interest first and foremost, um, because we are selfish creatures built for survival. In this case, an officer is uh, working for the government, working for his department, and his incentive is to continue to get money, to continue to have that security, to continue to live. And so when his boss says don't do something, most people look the other way and don't help because it's against their personal interests. He acted courageously and went against his best interests and went against the interests of the department because, and, and ultimately helped Amanda. So you have, and that's the problem. And then of course, once the best, you know, and so in that system where that person acts courageously and does what is best for another human being and their survival and not what is best for their interests, the bureaucracy says, you can't get out of line like that. You can't violate the rules like that. We're gonna punish you. Well, and as we go on, you'll really understand the gravity of his superior saying, you should write a letter saying how great we were. Um, because that superior actually was probably the worst officer I ever had to contact or put up with through any of this. Hmm. Um, so once, um, once the, the sheriff officer who was helpful made contact with me and said that, he said, he said, I don't, he said, I, I'm not trying to make you feel uncomfortable. I'm not trying to get too personal. But my aunt was harassed and stalked and she lost her life. 
and her ex-husband now is serving life in an Ohio penitentiary for it. And then I found out that he used to be a detective for specific crimes of this nature, hunting down the, the person, the abuser. Mm -hmm. um, and he just had a lot of knowledge on it that um, ended up being really our saving grace. So what you, what you end up having is, uh, and this is what we talk about, we don't need the bureaucracies to support us because the more contact we have each other, the more empathy we will build. And we will oftentimes, the way that we will move beyond our own self-interest is if we find empathy in another person's story. And this officer found, uh, could relate to what Amanda and her family were going through. He was the only officer too that made me feel the least bit comfortable actually talking to him. Um, before, officers that came to the door, um, when I called 911 because he was outside, would ask me for my phone number, ask me out on dates. You're kidding me. No. Um, which is, you know, the last thing at your mind at that point in time. You know, you're, you're scared for your life. You don't care if they get some or not. You know, the my armchair psychologist says, well, they're e easy, easy targets. <laughs> you know, you're emotionally broken down, you're beaten down, you're without, you know, and so uh, you become an easy target for somebody like that. Absolutely. Wow, that's incredible. So, and I think, and he even, um, the officer that was helpful to me even touched base on that a little later. He said, you know, the reason he just kept assuring me that he didn't mean anything personal by it, he just wanted to help, felt like the system was failing me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and that he knows a lot of officers abuse that power when they meet a victim. And he, he just wanted to make sure that he was clear that that was not his intentions. And that went a long way because I was really, really skeptical at first. Okay, so you you leave your house and you go to the to the local shelter, the women's On shelter. On your 30th birthday. On your 30th birthday. And uh, you then land where when they don't have room for you? Um, well, so this is before my 30th birthday, actually. Um, so they send me up to Kokomo, and I am stuck in traffic. I've picked up my kids from their school, and I am stuck in traffic. I have to be there by a certain point for intake, or I can't stay there tonight. And I sat in a traffic jam for two and a half hours, missed intake by 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, this just is not going to work. There's no way my kids can maintain school. And the detective and the prosecutor are meeting, and they're telling me I need to keep my daughter's visitation the same. I need to not let him know that I've gone into a shelter because they've got this in the works to catch him. And if they can't get all the evidence they need because he suddenly changes what he's doing, you know, they may not be able to prosecute for what he's done to my daughter. Right. So... I'm thinking, how am I going to drive to Kokomo every single night, be there before intake, and still keep the kid's routine the same so sure. that he doesn't change anything and they can still prosecute for the charges against my daughter? Mm -hmm. So I called the, I actually text him. Um, he's pretty busy, so um, I would text the officer that's helpful, and when he had a minute between runs or whatever, he would always respond to me and give me advice. So I explained to him the situation about the shelter, and he says, let me make a few phone calls. I know of some safe houses. Let me see if they're full. Um, he responded back with, unfortunately, they are full. What is a safe house? A safe house is they're through the police department or the sheriff's department, depending on which one, but they are designated people that either are retired officers or retired detectives or just friends of officers and detectives that open up their home to be a safe home for mm -hmm. victims to stay in for one night. Nice. Okay. So um, he said he knew a couple safe houses, but those were already full and we weren't able to go there. So he said, gave me a list of different hotels that um, have programs with police stations and sheriff's departments that will give you discounted rates on hotel rooms for the night if you can prove that you're a victim. So I would have to take in my protective order and the photographs. Right. Um, which is difficult to do with two small children when you're trying for them not to find out everything that's going on. I mean, they obviously, they're highly intelligent. Yeah. They know something is up, but I don't want them to know the details. I don't want yeah. them to be terrified. Your, your kids are very uh, emotionally intelligent 
for as young as they are, and they're very, 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 very intelligent. And uh, remarkably well-adjusted. You know, they are, uh, I absolutely adore your kids. They're like my niece and nephew. Um, how do, how did you manage, and I mean, I've kind of watched this. I mean, you, you answer their questions honestly. You know, more in the 100,000 view, foot view, than the five foot view. Um, you never have, in my presence, lied to your kids or told them or misdirected in any way, shape, or form. Um, you know, you're, you don't even, like, uh, the big guy from the North Pole. Uh, <laughs> um, I mean, how, how have you managed to let them be kids and not burden them with any responsibility or any of the, the tough knowledge that comes with all this? Well, they have a right to know part of it. Um, they certainly don't have any right to the details. And so I always try to answer their question as simply as I can without being brash or detail specific. Or emotional even. No, just just very factual that this is what it is. Um, because there's nothing we can do to change it. There's yeah. nothing we can do about it. Um, but then when they push too hard or they ask too detailed question, I just tell them, you know, it's none of their business. Yeah. You're, you're a kid and mommy will do whatever she can to protect you, yeah. is what I've heard you say yeah, most of the time. They're the kids. They don't need to worry about it. I ask them, you know, when has there been a time in their lives that I haven't taken care of them? Yeah. And, you know, you have the tightest little family ever because of all this. While it is, um, there's a book called The Good Stuff of Growing Up. Um, I forget what it is, but it's basically the, the, the premise is, listen, when you go through hardship, you come out with certain benefits like humor, uh, a depth of emotional range, a, a, a deeper intelligence, an empathy towards other people. I mean, I know through the things that I've gone through as a kid and the things that I've gone through as an adult, I love adversity. I love the hard times. I mean, I don't love it when I'm in it, and I don't love the emotions that go along with that, but at the end of the day, it has made me a better person. And I do think that, that your kids, while they have gone through some really tough stuff, have come out of it with a lot of gifts. Yeah, but the unfortunate thing is they're still going through it. Yeah, and, and we'll get to that. To come out of it, they have to actually come out of it. Right. So I, I know that no matter what they face and what they go through, as long as they can get out of it, they're going to be okay. Yeah. So they are uh, really resilient, awesome kids. Um, so, so you go to a local hotel and you stay there. One night. One night. And then what? I, um, well, it took me six hotels to find someone who would actually help with the cost of staying there one night. Mm -hmm. And even then, I had to sp spend $75 on that one night. Mm -hmm. um, I go back to the Julian Center the next day and I explain to them Kokomo's not going to work can't make that drive and do what the detective and the prosecutor are telling me I need to do. Um, and I ask them for a place to stay and they say, well, we can put you on our waiting list, but typically it takes a month or two. So then I'm looking at $75 minimum a night for two months with the salary I make, knowing that I can't buy and store food, we have to eat out everywhere we go. Right. I can't afford it. Mm -hmm. So I tap into the helpful sheriff once again. I say, this is what's up. I can't keep doing this. He says, stay with only friends that never met your ex. Only people you've met since being apart. Never stay in the same place two nights in a row. You really, at this point, uh, and this is where you and I kind of meet here shortly after this, I mean, you are living a nomadic life, a very paranoid life, a very highly, I mean, your, your, uh, what, the adrenaline, the, the fight or flight for the next year, I would say year, year and a half is just in full gear. Yeah. Um, I, I don't remember sleeping much. You didn't. I mean, I, I, you, when you were here, you may have slept a little better, but once you guys moved into your own place. I mean, it was, you were up all night guarding. Yeah. You know, um, and never sleeping. So, so do you get into the Julian Center at this point? No. No, we start crashing with, um, 
acquaintances, really, people that we don't know all that well, which is a risk in and of itself. Um, but people that you know, I've, I've worked with for a while and I feel are trustworthy people um, and, and making up a few rules for us, such as um, if you need to go to the bathroom, we all go and stand outside the door. You know, nobody is left alone in their home because mm. we don't know them that well. And under no circumstances is anybody sleeping in a separate room for me. Right. Um, you know, just rules to make sure that they're safe because we don't know these people that well that we are now being forced to stay with and right. forced to confide in and tell what's going on and knowing that even police try to take advantage of us. Your whole life becomes a, a, a math story problem, a, a puzzle of security. Yeah. I mean, you're, you know, when I meet you, your whole life is figuring out how is turning on the on the airplane mode on your phone all the time, turning off every GPS location, making sure that your world is so incredibly small and that everybody with, you know, your world at one point was five people maybe, yeah. you know, even limited contact with your mother um, because you had to keep your circle so tight because it, your security demanded it. Yeah. And at the same time, rebuilding a new circle with people that you didn't know because they wouldn't have had any contact with him. Yeah. Like when you when you crashed with me, he wouldn't have known me. He had never heard my name. There was absolutely no connection between us other than being Facebook friends and once you block all that, I mean it's your whole world became worrying about things like iCloud and find my iPhone and is am I being followed and where are we going to sleep and all that and kind of securing my own bank account mm -hmm. so that the, at one point so he used to follow me from picking up the kids from school or from um, my daughter was in daycare not really school but um, from picking her up or picking my son up or from leaving work and I would have to call 911 and we eventually figured out that he was actually tracking my phone using my phone number yeah. and the GPS in it. Um, and then there was another time that, you know, I was staying with a friend that I hadn't seen since high school who lived uh, close to where my mom lived, and he drove past. I mean, can you imagine the horror to be getting the kids loaded in there, and there he goes right past that house. Right. Um, and talking to them, trying to figure it out, turns out he contacted them through my Facebook account. Um, several times and then when I actually messaged them through my Facebook account they had no idea that it had been two separate people yeah. so when they gave him the address they thought they were giving it to me mm -hmm. um, so then Facebook people became you know not so safe and that's why I grilled you so much about you know yeah have you talked to anybody or have you messaged me directly other than right you know because it um, it was a huge issue yeah so and and we locked all that down and to this day you really you don't have social networking uh, no, no. um so you then uh, yeah so then at what point do you get into the julian center so we did that for about two months and we ran out of people to stay with right um, we had repeated a few and mainly by that point i'd spent three weeks driving around in my car all night long Mm -hmm. while the kids slept and I remember going into the center saying look you can kick us out but we have nowhere to go and they said well can't you sleep in your car and I said we have been for three weeks I haven't slept and we'll sleep on your floor please just don't make us leave so they made room in their library and we slept on their floor until the bed finally came open yeah and then after a certain period of time, a room opens up, but you're sharing a room with another family. Multiple families. Right. Um, when we first started, we shared the room with four different families. And it becomes, whereas you are a person who has built uh, your own life and you have your own support system, your own network, you then are put into a very structured environment, which is not conducive to working and being an independent person. No, um, I mean a few of the highlights were until that point we'd been wearing the same set of clothes over and over again without being able to wash them. Right. Um, because you had you had left and you uh, left with nothing. You left with nothing for a second time. For a second time, you the first time you left, you had left with nothing. You had spent 
two years rebuilding everything from Goodwill purchases. And then from there, you had to leave it all behind, pack up what was ever in your whatever was in your car. Uh, a friend stored some things um, that you didn't see for another several months. Well, they went back actually. So after we went into the Julian Center, um, we got a I got a call from the detective and the prosecutor that uh, the judge approved it mm -hmm. that they were going to issue a warrant for his arrest. Mm -hmm. um, and I was told that they would let me know when the warrant was issued. Um, so how they book court cases is there is they double book right. every single court case. And there's case one and case two. That way if the one cancels through or reaches an agreement, they don't have to wait and try to get something to go on. Right. Um, so we were case two on three different days. And then the further one we were case one on on the fourth day. So it could be anywhere from three days to a month and a half longer before the warrant is actually issued. Um, so what we were told is they would notify me, you know, as soon as the warrant went through. And I had, from the time that he was arrested to the time that he posted bail to move whatever I could and never go back. Mm -hmm. So um, I had really great friends that came and helped me pack as much as we could. When I got that phone call, and, and this is one great feature that we do have set up. So if you are the victim, you can actually subscribe via telephone with the case number, and they will let you know when your um, abuser has been released. Mm -hmm. They call you as they are checking out of the jail. Right. So I got that phone call, and I had to leave, but my friends were such diehard friends that they actually stayed and finished packing whatever they could and moving whatever they could. Through a pr pretty significant amount of emotional... Uh, I mean, that was an emotional affair for them. I mean, they were... they You know... Uh, you were the one hunted, but it still was certainly a dangerous situation for anybody connected to you at that point in time. Yes, yes, because um, he was following whatever leads he could to find me. Right. So they stayed, they packed up some stuff, but you didn't have that for months. and uh, I couldn't take it into the Julian Center. Right. We did at least finally get some clothes. So what could you take into the Julian Center? Tell me about what, what life is like inside of a women's shelter. A lot like a prison, I would imagine. Okay. Um, just from what I've heard of prison, I've never been to prison myself other than to visit people in there. Um, but I did in high school a little bit of volunteering as far as cooking meals and changing beds over in a prison, a woman's prison. Um, well, they preferred correctional facility. But, mm -hmm. um, but a lot like that. I mean, so breakfast was served at a specific time. You had X number of minutes to eat and get your stuff cleaned up and cleared out. Um, you were on lockdown in your bedroom at this time. You could shower between this time and this time. You had to attend this number of classes or seminars or this much therapy to stay there. Um, you had to eat what they provided, so if you had an allergy, forget it. Hmm. Um, it just, I mean, they tried. They really did. They tried to do it, but with my son's extreme amount of allergies, um, it was very difficult. They, they couldn't match his yeah. requests. And then the other thing they needed is the doctor's note for that. And, you know, not having any of my belongings made it really hard to have even that doctor's note. Um, just to stay there, I had to buy second copies of birth certificates for them. I had to go to the Social Security office and get all new Social Security cards because we left without those. All of... Uh and in this situation, time and money is at a high premium. And you had to be in by 6 every night. By 6 every night. Right. And dinner was served strictly at 5.30. Right. And so you missed most of your meals. We missed every meal. Yeah. And then there were announcements all the time. Yes. Even late into the night. Yes. Um, there were, and they had different code violations and different codes. And if you went to the bathroom and they caught you going to the bathroom in the middle of the night, they'd announce, you know, all, all, um, all members should be in their rooms right now. This is on lockdown. And so the, the kids, because I had kids, their bedtime was 8 o'clock there. They had to be in bed, showered, teeth brushed, everything in bed by 8 o'clock, um, which isn't that late except for by the time I left work, picked them up, fed them something that we had to buy out because they'd missed dinner at 5.30 because I didn't get off work until 5. And then you went across town to pick them up. Across town to pick them up because right. I could not change their school. 
according to the prosecutor and detective. I couldn't change any of that. So I'd go across town to pick them up, get them something to eat, allow them time to eat it, and get in. They had a half an hour to brush their teeth, shower, and get to bed. Right. And then we ha- also had to do like their therapy and their um, the programs there as well. So we would spend many, many weekends doing those things. Yeah. So that's you're there when you and I meet and you had questions about locking down your Facebook account and I started talking to you and just was um, (laughs) moved to help and in shock by all of this and put up a Facebook status just saying hey I've got a friend they need some stuff five days a hundred people donated literally everything you needed including the cash for the stuff that wasn't donated my whole apartment I was thinking about this the other day I haven't thought about it in a while like how packed this place was and then uh, you you guys moved in for a brief period of time while your place was getting ready and um, you know I was going through my divorce at that time and was definitely seeking a replacement family <laughs> um, and there was definitely some codependent things happening but it truly is one of the best summers I've ever had getting to spend time with you guys and uh, looking back but um, it was now you're gonna cry. I am I know <laughs> because it was just tough you know to to see three people that you immediately fall in love with and uh, there's they're in danger and um, going through a lot of emotional stuff because your when your safety is threatened it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs when your fundamental safeties in my entire life I mean I've lived a pretty good life I mean I've gone through some stuff uh, but I've lived a pretty good life and I have never ever in my life had a point where that bottom need for safety had been disrupted and it was eye-opening to see that for the first time and to to see what you guys have dealt with uh, was difficult and you you (laughs) struggled to get a place which I think a lot of people you know so you were here longer than I said well you know get out of the Julian Center early it is only a week come on over uh, but it you had in I think it's hard to understand how when your life is turned upside down I mean mine my when I was uh, when my ex-wife and I agreed to divorce I had six days to put my whole life together you know but I didn't have kids I had a little bit of savings and money and credit I had you know I, I I didn't have that structured environment I mean the amount that you had to do to put your life back together you had lost everything. Um, and people don't want to rent to you. You're a, you're a yeah. risk. You're a risk to their property damage. Right. Because, God forbid, somebody comes in and dies on your property. Or, you know, they show up and they bust the window, or you end up having to shoot them, or, right. you know, or you miss them and there's a bullet hole in their drywall. Yeah. Um, even, even when we... Even when we moved out of the referral place that Julian Center gave us, I had a hard time finding a place. They would run my credit report and they would see that on there and they would instantly say, well, you don't make enough income. And I'd say, yes, I do, here's the proof. Here's here's what I make. I mean, it's right here. You can't, I mean, your policy's written in black and white. You can't tell me that's the reason. You also had abysmal credit because you had had someone who was financially destructive making decisions for you forever. Well, and the bigger issue was that I had had no credit the entire time right. we were married, nothing. Um, so, it was like starting at zero right so you finally find a place and it's the biggest dump on the planet it is not fit I mean, it was, it was a place that Julian Center recommended as being easy for women to get into right which it was it was very easy to get the lease there right but when we went to move in and being in the center only being able to get out at certain times for our safety and having to sign out where we go, and if it wasn't to work, you were only allowed out for an hour's window yeah. at a time before you had to report back in. And you're putting your whole life together in, in that one window. Yeah. Yeah. And so I had the opportunity to look at the rental one time, and when I went in, there were people, you know, 
doing construction on it, fixing things up, and I'm told this is going to be done and that's going to be done and this is going to be done. And I really think that they were just uh, friends of the owner who were just pretending to work so that I would sign the lease. Because um, when we went to move in, the ceiling was falling down, the walls were molded, and part of the floor was coming up, and there was still stuff left in there from previous tenants, and not it wasn't something we could just move into. Yeah. And he wasn't going to fix it. No. I mean, you had to do all the work yourself. And there were possums in there. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> no, it was raccoons and possums. And possums and raccoons. It, it, it was a comedy of errors. I mean, it really was just every... I mean, there were nights where you, you'd you go and you'd work all night and get this place ready and then come pick up the kids before I had to leave for work at 5.30 in the morning. And then, I mean, you... Get them ready for school and daycare, send them off, go to work myself, come yep. and cook dinner, have yep. dinner, and sometimes not have dinner, just cook dinner and leave. Yep. I mean, the amount of that year after you left the Julian Center, the amount of sleep and food you got is what I get in a month, easily. And a whole, I mean, it just was, it was, uh, and meanwhile, you're not even dealing with all of the emotional fallout of everything because you're not even able to. No. I mean, you, uh, and, and I don't, you know, and you're dealing with putting your life together, getting all this stuff. I mean, and, for me, uh, just to put out a Facebook status and to see the generosity of a hundred people without question, I, nobody ever asked, are you serious, is this a joke or anything, and people just gave. Because I put up one status that said, somebody needs help, they've lost everything, and I'm collecting stuff, and I spent a week collecting it. To have a hundred people just react in that way to the point that I just couldn't hold any more in here, it just was one of the greatest privileges that I've ever had be just to, to experience that level of generosity from people. I know I cried more over that than I ever did when I left him. Yeah, it was truly amazing. Uh, and <laughs> honestly, things like that, and that's what we talk about on the show a lot is when you make that effort and it, it was very minimal effort on my part I had met a friend in, in trouble somebody I didn't even really know that well I hadn't talked to you since we had class together in high school all I remembered was Chris wearing a dress going from classroom to classroom <laughs> yeah it's a lady's dress um, He's dressed like an old woman with <laughs> boobs and everything and they're lopsided there's got to be a photo somewhere but you know, and just is bright red. oh, like a tomato. <laughs> uh, people just respond to other people's call for help because they may themselves be in that position one day and they want the favor returned, or they have been, and that that opened up so many new friendships for me, and uh, finding so many new uh, just there were conversations that I had in in that moment where I was just acting as the collector you know that it, it was so at a, at a time when I had three months before my life had fallen apart I chose to give and I chose to do something and other people chose to give and it did so much for both you and I I mean it just was uh, fantastic so giving truly is um, healing and Taxation is theft. <laughs> um, so see how charitable you are on April 15th. So you you get moved into your place. You get settled. You get various security apparatuses set up. You pick the place out and put together plans, and you start building your world. Again, you have a, a great supportive boss. You have, uh, through the ordeal, through the trial, you have built supportive friendships. You've built... You know, you start rebuilding your kids' lives, your life. Um, what is, what, go ahead. I, well, I think you're skipping a big part of government failure um, that you may not even know about, but the actual pending of the arrest of him. So that's kind of where I want to go. I want to go back okay. to him now. So um, the pending the arrest of him, we're in the Julian Center. And just, just in case you're wondering, the hardest part of all of it was claiming that you are homeless. Right. That you are a victim. 
and to go to the homeless shelter, you do have to sign and write a statement that you are a victim and you are homeless because of it. There's something about the emotional impact of those words and seeing it in black and white that affects you. And you writing it. Yeah. Um, that was, and that was my birthday. Yeah. So you, so, so you um, go into the Julian Center. We're in the Julian Center. The detective, um, the detective and the, the prosecutor tell me they're going to notify me when the warrant goes out. Um, I've kept in touch with the helpful sheriff this whole time, and he actually finds out about the warrant going out before they have notified me. Mm -hmm. And he calls me and tells me that he pulled it out of the system, that the sheriff's department has it, and the sheriff's department will do the arrest. Okay. Um, and we are trying to orchestrate and work together to make sure my daughter is not there when her father gets arrested. Right. Unfortunately, <laughs> the warrant came out at 430 and I even had arrangements with her daycare that they were going to just hold her in the back if the warrant had been posted and say, oh, she's not here. You know, you'll have to take it up with your attorneys or whatever, but she's already gone for the day and lie to him so that she would not be there when he got arrested. Right. And they could only do that if the warrant had been posted. Mm -hmm. So I call the daycare after I speak to the sheriff and I find out that he picked her up literally five minutes previous to that. So now we have my daughter in his custody at the time that the arrest is going to occur. Mm -hmm. um, the sheriff's department gets over and is doing the arrest. I get a call about two hours later asking me to come pick up my daughter. Um, when I arrive at my ex's house to pick up my daughter, I'm scolded by the sheriff that's there. Okay. How dare I do this to my daughter? She's the one that's hurting from this. This poor man is just trying to be a good father. Um, there's no reason for me to be doing false accusations and trying to keep him from seeing her. Yeah, I've never heard this story. That's amazing. I mean... So, I am livid. Mm -hmm. I tell the helpful sheriff what has happened and how upset I am. And a little bit later, I get a phone call from the sheriff, the arresting sheriff, who says, you know, he's in our custody, you're gonna have to keep your daughter, visitation will be temporarily pinned, here's the phone number you need to call, um, you know, to register the fact that he's been arrested, you know, and that they'll let you know when he's out, this is the time you need to get your stuff and move, and I suggest you move, because once these charges fall through, he's gonna be back at his place, and you need to stop harassing him. Wow. And then they continue to say, so I see that this sheriff, the helpful one, um, and he used his name, said, I see that he pulled this and sent it for us to run instead of IMPD, and this is normally IMPD's district. I also see that he's the one that wrote up initial reports for what was going on. So what is your relationship with him? Are you sleeping with him? Oh, my God. Um, I went off on the guy. And his argument was, well, now you're not even going to see child support. And my response was, I've never seen child support. And when we got off the phone, I called the sheriff back, the helpful sheriff back, and I told him what had happened. And that's when I found out that the sheriff that I had been talking to who made all those comments and the one that scolded me was his supervising manager, the one that refused to help me when I was in office. <laughs> Of course. The one that later on asked me to write a letter saying what a wonderful job they did. Does he have a relationship to your ex? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. That's hard to comprehend. But my ex is very, he's very suave. He's very charming. You know, he, and for some reason in our court system, there is this hatred of women. Um, and, and I don't mean to make it sound sexist, but it, it really is. You know, these babies' mamas, or what they call them, you know, will do anything to keep the dad from seeing the baby, and they just try to give dads a bad rap. Right. And that's not always true, you know. And it was really once the... Um, so I, I guess the supervisor did a little checking, and he actually called me, I was almost a week later, and gave me a formal apology and said he did some looking into it and he saw that I wasn't receiving any child support. 
and that he was very sorry and that this must have been a very hard time for me and he was sorry he added to it and I said well you should be and hung up the phone it sounds like he did a little extra digging to try and screw you. <laughs> uh, that's kind of what I thought. Yeah. There wasn't anything there. Right. That, that, that's honestly the only reason that he should have been doing any extra digging uh, is that he wanted to make things harder for you because uh, that's a pattern. So he gets arrested and then what? Um, so we move, people move and store my things. Um, we get to the point where we are pending his, my ex's trial, um, and we have a decision to make with Julian Center. Do we go into their extended housing where the same rules apply, um, we'll have the same food issues, and we pay them rent? Or do we try to move out and start a life and make that secure? Um, I decided the normalcy for my kids was, was really important. Um, we were lucky enough that in my ex's sentencing, which, and, and fortunately I had his sentencing happened within three days of me having to make that final decision. Mm -hmm. And at his sentencing, um, the prosecutor was really wonderful. She kept me out of it. She had to offer him a plea because it was his first time being charged. And she said it can go one of two ways. We can give him a higher sentence but we would have to leave the charges off against your kids. Or we can keep the charges on that include your kids and some of them that include you and drop these other ones down where the sentence would be less, but your kids would be on a protective order. And for me, that was a no-brainer. Yeah. Keep my kids on a protective order. I don't care what happens to him. Keep my kids safe. Um, so my kids are on the protective order, and because... They were able to submit, because I had done the double documentation of all the pictures, they were able to actually submit the photographs into court, mm -hmm. which is something she said they had never been able to do with a stalking charge. And the pictures are absolutely horrifying. Yeah, they're terrifying. If you have never been stalked or you've never even seen him or know who he is, either way, to see those pictures just sends, I mean, it's like watching a scary movie. It is, because it's, it's that grainy game camera look to it where it's greenish it's limeish green and it's just him 193 photos of him peering into your windows in addition i documented me picking up the um, crowbar picking up the wire where they were set beforehand i had double documentation of all that and they actually had the crowbar and they actually had the um that's to wrap yourself because oh. you're <laughs> clearly freezing <laughs> They, or, or. I was like, what are you throwing a towel at me? I'm not <laughs> <laughs> um, they, they had the crowbar in evidence. They had the wire in evidence. Wow. Um, so one of the charges that he initially was arrested on was attempted murder, which was obviously dropped in the plea to keep my children on. Um, and that one was a bit of a stretchier one that would have required me to go in and actually testify at court, which I wasn't against, but if there was a way that I didn't have to see him again, I preferred not to. Sure. Um, so he actually was put on his, he was given a, a 12 and a half year sentence that was suspended. Okay. Um, so he was able to go free. He was put on probation instead. Um, 12, 12 and a half years pled down to? No, not pled down to. That was the sentence that he, Okay. the plea agreement he agreed to. 12 okay. and a half years. And he had served 20 days. And the 12 and a half years was um, put so that he could serve them consecutively, which would have lowered it down to three and a half years. Mm -hmm. And then those three and a half years were completely suspended because he had served 20 days. And the rest of it was put on probation with a GPS monitoring device. Mm -hmm. Let's pause there and take a quick break. So you can get a coat. I can turn off the air and go to the bathroom.
sure. Uh -huh. Well, guess what? I don't have goosebumps, I'm fine. <laughs> Just in case, because I feel bad because I have it so cold. I keep my house cold too. Alright. Because I'm cheap. Oh shit. My house has been at 57 all winter. Oh, that's nice. That's what I like it. Okay. What time do you have to leave? I have to get my blood out. Okay. We got plenty of time. All right. Um, so he serves limited time and he's charged with child neglect and. He ends up playing to child neglect. Um, of, it's child neglect slash solicitation of my daughter. Um, harassment and stalking of my son plus a charge of harassment and stalking of me. Okay. So then he gets on GPS monitoring. He serves 20 days in jail. You were hoping for a far different outcome. You were hoping for time in prison because that would have allowed you to feel safe because you know where he's at. I didn't care too much what happened to him. I just really wanted them to make him go away. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so then you, uh, so, so then what's the next chapter of the story? So, crim so criminals kind of closed out at that point. Yes. In order to see... Um, our daughter, again, he has to complete X number of classes, classes for parenting, classes for domestic violence, um, and the court has to be satisfied that he's complied with all of those t in order to see her again. Right. And the criminal courts recommended that it start off with supervised visitation. Mm -hmm. So, um, a year passes and he's completed those and he decides that he would like to see his daughter again. Um... The one that he hurt previously. Mm -hmm. uh, she started before she would come home with bruises and the, the diaper rash and that sort of thing. And as it was explained to me through the Julian Center, that is what they do. They do that because they have to get a reaction from you then. She she is just a tool in his mind to get to force, val validation from you in some way. To, to force interaction with you. Gotcha. Um, so instantly when he gets off of it, he files with the family court that he needs to see his daughter immediately. Of course, everything with the family court as far as visitation and everything being finalized was put on hold for all the criminal court things. Mm -hmm. um, so. And there had been multiple calls to DCS ab yes. about him um, yes. and statements she had made and... The bruises and that sort of thing. Yes, and, right. and none of that ever went anywhere because by the time CPS actually got the information and was able to do something, Juliet was already on a criminal protective order. Oops. Take your name out. Thank you. And I said, I said something right there. That wasn't on. That okay. wasn't on there. Um, so I, I personally made one report to CPS and then went to visit them later with you and they had no record that they had no concept that I had called or they they just it was very clear your caseworker wasn't familiar with the case it's a well-meaning system that is not at all linked within itself mm -hmm. um so it's it's yeah system of referrals but so Julie um that's okay so my daughter um, is, you know, away from her dad for almost a year at this point. And she's young, so the only things she had said about her dad were alarming things that the Julian Center, the doctor's offices, all reported to CPS. Mm -hmm. um, and we meet with the judge because my ex has filed this appeal to resume parenting time. Mm -hmm. um, in that court date... Um, she's not able to do anything because he hasn't even met with the criminal court yet. Right. And doesn't even have her lifted off of the protective order. Mm -hmm. So the judge says that when that happens, the visitation will be supervised and it will be paid by him because he committed the crime and he still had not paid child support yet because none of that stuff got really official officialized through the court system right. before the criminal stuff took place. Mm -hmm. So... 
I left with the understanding of, okay, my daughter's going to start seeing him again, but it's going to be court supervised and they're going to be able to say, this is good, this is bad, and you stay this way and make sure my daughter's safe. Yeah. You had multiple reports from various different agencies yes. along those lines, including the criminal court outlining how this is supposed to happen. And I looked into, you know, um, the state law as far as when there is a criminal no contact order, which is what he has, a lifetime criminal no contact order with myself and with Michael, mm -hmm. um, with my son. And that is, with that, there is a separate set of visitation laws and rules. And I, I read a bunch of information about domestic violence and the children and how it works best to phase in um, visitation. And I put it all together and sent it to my attorney to submit to the judge, and my ex did the same. And when my daughter was lifted off of his protective order, he was granted joint custody with a visitation of every other day for one week and not at all for the next week. Okay. With the times to be determined by the two of us getting together and discussing them, as well as locations of exchanges to be determined by us cooperating together and discussing the location places. Not supervised. Not supervised. He gets overnight visitation. <clears throat> he gets... Immediately. He has 50-50 rights, <coughs> despite his con has, conviction for child neglect. He has more legal neglect. rights to her now than he did, than, than he did before the criminal protective order. How is that possible? I don't know. The DCRB recommended less, CPS recommended less, and the judge still ordered it. The family court judge? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I mean, is it possible that somebody, like a, a judge like that, they have such a big caseload that they, uh, I mean, is it possible that they just don't made even, that they, they made a mistake or don't read something and just want to clear it off and just thought, go whatever? I mean, that's what I thought. I, I thought that was what was happening. I, I was like, isn't there some way we can ask him to review, to relook at it? And when we did that, the case was moved to a different judge, and that judge refused to see it. Moved it back down to the judge that it's at, and to this day, he has, we have not been seen or heard since this decision was made, mm -hmm. and it's now been a year. Mm -hmm. um, he has a violation of the, um, of the protective, the initial protective order from three years ago that has never been heard. Mm -hmm. He has a violation from a year ago that has never been heard when he first started seeing her. Because, because of what the family court judge ordered, it directly violated the criminal protective order. Okay. The criminal no contact order. So the family court ordered a direct violation of the criminal no contact order. So then what happens? How did the, the, the two courts are conflicting, so then what do you do? I ended up going to the prosecutor who tried the case, and they had to put it back before the criminal court. They made it clear to him that he cannot pick up our daughter from the daycare if my son is there. He cannot force himself to be in contact with me by dropping her off after the daycare is closed and making me go there, or by making us meet at a public place and driving around looking for me in the parking lot so that he hands her off to me instead of the contact person he's supposed to hand her off to. Mm -hmm. And he had to sign an agreement that he understood that and that any contact, any form of contact with me or third party form of contact with me or asking questions about me or my son is a violation. So if he's asking daycare workers, a relative of yours, violation, sending a note, violation. Okay. Has he upheld his signed agreement? No. Has he repeatedly violated it? Yes. Okay. It's to the point that my son cannot even go to that daycare on spring break, summer break, nothing. He cannot attend that daycare with my daughter. So it seems like the victim and the family members under the protective order, that tells me that you guys have undue hardship because of his choices. That's he, correct. He should be the one that has to pay prices, not you. That's correct. Right. But that's not how it's working. It's... Just just last week, um, the daycare is closed, which is our exchange point for, I mean, just this past Friday, is the exchange point for our daughter. Mm -hmm. um, my mom is the exchange person um, other when the daycare is closed. So he was to pick our daughter up from the daycare Friday night, but it was closed for Good Friday. So we made arrangements for him to pick her up at my mom's work 
How do you two communicate? Is it through an attorney? or I send a message to the attorney, and the attorney sends it to his attorney, who sends it to him. Okay. And I don't know if the message is actually getting messed up by the time it gets to him, or if he's just being a butt, because we all know who he is. Right. But he always is like, well, no, she never offered that. She offered this, like, outlandish thing. Like, I could pick her up, you know, two hours away from here. Which, obviously, I'm not an unreasonable person. I would never, I wouldn't want to drive that far to drop her off. I can personally attest that you uh, are in the in the other child's situation. The older child, in that situation, you're very reasonable and you're very accommodating. Yes. And then he claims that you're not, which is so far-fetched. Like, everything he says about you, I don't... I don't personally So see. then my mom ends up being stuck in the middle where she has to say, because we don't hear from him, so we'll say, hey, the daycare is going to be closed. How about pick her up from my mom's work? This is what time it works with my mom's schedule, mm -hmm. her work schedule. Um, and he'll say, no, I'm not driving to your mother's house. Well, we'll say we didn't ask you to drive to my mom's house. We asked you to drive 10 minutes away from the daycare and pick her up, which is actually five minutes closer to your house. Right. You know, and he'll say, no, you didn't ask me that. Well, that's what my attorney showed me in writing that I said. So they're sending writing to your attorney. I don't know where the message is getting reversed. Right. But he refused to see her one time, and then the second time he said he would. Um, and the second time would be this Friday, uh, this past Friday. And so he didn't respond, though. He doesn't tell us until the day of that he's actually going to pick her up or he's not going to. And when it's left up to him, like if he has her and I'm supposed to get her back from him, I don't find out where I'm getting her back or the time frame that I'm supposed to get her back in until a half an hour before I'm supposed to get her back. Well, how does that, how does that message get to you so quickly? I, it doesn't get to me so quickly. I mean, it's so he he had her one weekend and I was supposed to get her Sunday night from him, and my mom was out of town in Utah with my son. And three months before they left, I said, we need to make arrangements for this weekend. I need to know where I'm going. Here's some viable options. Here's some people you can drop her off with that I can pick her up from. And I even offered to drive up to Noblesville, where his mom was at to do the exchange, if he was more comfortable. He's got a brother that lives less than 10 minutes from him, 10 minutes from my work. Mm -hmm. I suggested his brother's place as being the most convenient and his brother being there as the exchange person and so Sunday at about five o'clock I find out that I have to be in Noblesville by six to pick her up or I don't get her back how can he make that decision he has her <laughs> he, he picked her up on Friday and already had her yeah but he can't just decide to keep her he did the courts haven't done anything about it so far. They haven't even heard his contempt from taking her on the days he wasn't supposed to take her three years ago. Yeah. So he's gotten away with it at every single step. What, what, you know. So why would he not? Right. It's a way of control. He's got to control what I'm doing, that I have to drop everything, where I'm going to be, and when I'm going to be there. Right. And this last Friday, um, he asked to pick her up earlier to my mom two days beforehand. Because my mom um, actually said, I need to know for work, you have to tell me now, or I'm not going to be able to do it. And so he said, yes, I'll be there to pick her up from your work, that's fine. And that's the only way we found out, and that was two days before, that was Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Which is still, you know, not a lot of notice, considering we tried for two weeks to get this worked out before that. And then on Thursday, he says, I'd like to pick her up two hours earlier than, than five o'clock. And my mom says, no, I'm sorry. This is the only time I can get it worked out with my boss. So it's at the end of the day, and it's not messing up our workflow and our meetings that she can come in here and I can do this for you. You know, this is my mom being inconvenienced to make sure that we're safe. Every every other day. I mean, the... the, the what I have to ask you, uh, consistency is so key with kids. Obviously, I'm not a parent, but I've learned a lot about parenting from you. Uh, and my sister having children, you've got a schedule with your daughter where it's every other day she's with one parent or another. Basically, so that she, that doesn't seem very consistent for her sake. So this is what he asked for. This is a schedule he chose, and that's if you go from Wednesday to Wednesday in a week, he has her Wednesday night, I have her Thursday night. He has her Friday night and Saturday night, I have her Sunday night. He has her Monday night, I have her Tuesday night. He has her Wednesday night again. 
and then he doesn't see her again till the following Wednesday. So the guy who has a conviction, a felonious conviction for child neglect, got to choose her schedule. Yes. Because he's such a concerned parent. And he chose to make her a ping pong ball in two different school districts that bounces back and forth. And no family court judge has outlined that that's unhealthy for all of you. No, but the therapist has. Right. But that's being ignored. So then how do you... What what's the 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 outcome? I mean, there's it just doesn't seem right that a criminal court would be completely ignored. I think would think a criminal court would take precedent over a family court slash civil court that's ruling. The agreement that he signed. I mean, that's kind of what the criminal court said. They said they can't prosecute him on that because the family court did order something contrary to what the criminal order is. So what he signed states that the criminal court order is more important and comes before the the civil court order, and that any contact with me, even if it's regarding or having to do with our daughter, is a violation. And And the next time he will be arrested. And that is consistently broken. It's consistently broken. Yeah. Just this last Friday, he, um, so after my mom told him no, she couldn't do it any earlier with with her work, he messaged her at four o'clock and said, I'm going to be there early. I'm just going to wait in the parking lot right by your building. And she said, no, security won't let you wait right by my building. Mm-hmm. And he said, well, then I'll wait in the gas station across the street where he could see everything that comes in and out and goes on. Um, according to the criminal no contact order, he can't even go to places he knows I frequent often. So if he knows I shop at Kroger, he's not allowed to go to Kroger. Right. Um, so for him to say, well, I'm going to wait across the street, knowing that I have to drop her off there and watch for me is a violation of the protective order. Right. So he messages my mom at 4.11. I'm supposed to drop off my daughter at 4.30 and says, I'm here waiting and watching. He just did it anyways. He did it anyways. And he just came off the GPS monitoring device two days ago. Oh, okay. Which, at one point we had found out that the GPS monitoring had been just down for two days. Yeah. (laughs) I mean, it really means nothing. It really really doesn't. What it allows them to do is, and this is how they put it to me, so after... He has hurt me. It confirms that it was him and he was the one there. Right. There's no There's no pre. Yeah, there's no no prevention. It's all it's all after the fact. Um so that's really just a joke that we have created in our system. Yeah. So it doesn't add any sense of security. So what is the outcome? So I mean what what is the how can you rectify this? I don't know. So I um we can't get a case in front of the civil court. You know, my daughter starts kindergarten next year. She needs to be enrolled in an actual school. Right. Not a daycare school. I'm not even allowed to enroll her without his consent because of what the judge ordered. I can't have any communication with him because that will start all of this up again. Um, you know, and he, he has said things to her like, you need to tell me where your mommy lives and you guys aren't going to live there very long because I'm going to come and take you back. You belong in my house. Um, you know, the, the doctors have documented sexual assault or physical assault. They can't tell which it is because she's too young to do a rape kit on. Mm-hmm. Um, CPS has been notified. They can't substantiate the visits because nobody will say it's sexual or it's physical abuse. And according to what CPS tells me, if they don't have that in writing, he can claim that it's the other one and get off and never be able to be charged with that again. And it's been multiple and it's been documented by doctors and nurses. And She's had bruising on her right. private area. That's been documented by the hospital um, where they said... You know, it's either physical or sexual assault. Um, but because they can't distinguish which one, it doesn't help. She's told her therapist that her dad hurts her in her private region. She's told her therapist that she's scared of her dad. We have drawings where she's drawn pictures of her dad that look like penises. Oh, wow. I didn't know that. Yeah. And nobody can seem to do anything. And meanwhile, he's come off of his GPS tracking device, and within the first three days... He is sitting to watch me drop her off and leave to see which direction I go in. And I mean, the court won't even see us. CPS has consen- continually just taken all this information in. They keep visiting you. 
they keep investigating your home and your refrigerator. They keep investigating it. Have they done a sweep of his house? He will not allow them in. He has to cooperate. Um, instead, they have to arrange where his attorneys are always present. Um, we finally got a guardian ad litem uh, appointed for the civil case. And she, I don't know where, it, I mean, it's been almost a year since she was appointed. And she came out and she checked our home. And she was very upset with me. She said that, um, you know, he feels like he's being charged with stuff he didn't d do because I'm forcing CPS out on him and claiming that she's being abused. And I have to consistently point out that I've not once been the cause or the source of the CPS report. You've never called CPS? Well, only in response to their calls. Okay. Um, I've always let, and that's a hard thing to do as a mom. Mm -hmm. But I've always let the hospitals report it, or the daycare report it, which they have. Um, I've always let the therapist report it, other sources, not me. Outcry witnesses that have heard her statements. Yes, yeah. yes, not not me, not coming from me. And they still claim that it's, I've told her to say that. It, it's even to the point that, so she says that she's scared. She goes in the first time for the meeting and she says that he's, you know, she can identify her body parts. She mm -hmm. knows what they are. The second time she goes in, you know, about six months later, she says that she's scared of her dad. Mm -hmm. That he's scary. The third time she goes in, she says that her dad hurts her. This is on record at CPS, that her dad hurts her. But because she doesn't give details as to how and where and when he's hurting her, they can't use that in court. And she is only four. Yeah. She can't possibly know time well enough to give those details. I mean, back when um, she was younger, and this was, there was, a, there was a long period of time where he didn't see her. Almost and, a year. Yeah, and in that period of time, she made rapid advances in her behavior. I mean, she just was a different girl. By the time I first met you guys, when she was coming out of the Julian Center, and she just stopped seeing him... And then once she started seeing him again, there's just been a number of clear behavioral indicators that there's something wrong. CPS has it documented that she started having accidents. She started hitting kids in class. Um, we actually have from the doctor's office where she was overly tired, almost lethargic, coming back from him for a week and a half, and I was terrified. And they found high levels of uh, basically an equate Benadryl in her system. Um, like he was giving it to her at night so she would sleep. Um, Did, and you had no clue no that clue. she was being given medicine? She's, she's supposed to go in for an allergy test because the diaper rash started appearing again um, after visiting him, and she has been potty trained for a number of years now. So, she, so she, I wanted to rule out every possibility that could be causing it, um, so I asked them to do an allergy test on her, but now she can't have that because he's giving her this medication at random times that can affect the outcome of that test. It, CPS, the family court, the police department, because they all they all tell you to go talk to one or the other. Yes, yes. Right now, um, in regards to this last incident on Friday, um, I'm told that, the, so the I, I'm told I need to go talk to the prosecutor now from the case before because the family court will not do anything. And the prosecuting court says, you know, the people that are supposed to put in these guidelines and make sure that this is upheld when there's a child involved, you know, that these no contact orders are upheld, is the family court. So aside from if they decide that they are actually going to prosecute him for what he did on Friday, that's the only way they would be, they'll be able to do it. How many times over the last two years, <laughs> and I asked this question knowing full well, roughly the answer but how many times have you had conversations where well they might prosecute him for this and then it just never materializes more than i can count i mean it's probably monthly yeah. where there's something that clearly happens everybody knows there's something wrong i'm just sorry we just can't do anything with this because it might affect this or we don't have enough this or whatever but then you hear about these cases where kids walk by themselves to uh park. to the park <laughs> And the parents get arrested. And the parents get arrested and the parents get, you know, but here's a, just a clear case. I don't understand why abuse just isn't abuse. How many government officials do you think you've come in contact with 
over to, over the last what is it four five years at this point? It'll be five years in October. And have you been granted a divorce? We're uncertain over that. <laughs> there, so the judge signed back in what was it? Gosh, I think it was three years ago. The judge signed divorce paperwork, an agreement mm -hmm. that he and I made up for the divorce. This right. is our agreement, which they prefer agreements rather than rulings. Sure. And the judge signed it, but he never signed it. And since it's an agreement, there's some argument that it's not valid because it does not have his signature. Okay. If it was a court order, then it would be valid either way. Okay. And the other side of that is, no, if the judge signed it, it makes it a court order, so it is valid. Okay. So we're not certain right now if we are. <laughs> uh, I, I told you guys, to our listening audience, I told you it just keeps getting more. I mean, there's literally at every point there's a ridiculousness. And, and I, I can vouch for Karen. It's not, it is not... Um, Fiction, I have, Karen is my best friend. I've walked side by side with her through a lot of this, and I can tell you, it is just the thing more than anything other that has just made me an anarchist. We have three filing bins full of proof, you know, full right. of the documentation to back it up. Even as far as, you know, if they tell me they don't have something on file, I say, can you give me a letter on Letterhead, you know, with the time and date stamp stating that this is not on file. Mm -hmm. Just so I have it. Yeah. I mean, she's been very meticulous and... and there's also some confusion about whether or not my son is still on the protective order, the criminal protective order really? as well. Wow. Which is what is allowing him to go to the daycare even though my son attends there. Because it was originally left off. They realized they mistakenly left it off, wrote it in and pinned before it was signed by the judge, but now they're claiming that it was written in afterwards. So we don't know if they're gonna honor my son being on there or not. So why tell your story? Why put this out there, especially if you're in the middle of it still and, you know? I mean, it's a huge risk. Um, it is a risk because judges don't like to hear that, you know, they think they've messed up and a big thing is always that they're afraid they're gonna order something out of spite. I don't think we can get much worse. Yeah. Um, you know, I think I think everybody has good intentions, but I think they're they're hurting people, and it needs to stop. And you know, the the population is the only people that can do anything about it. You know, um, I never never mean to you know support war or say war is a good thing, but. If your government is not serving the people, maybe it's time for a new government. I mean, people have made every decision possible to protect the rights of your ex. And you wouldn't always give them at, the benefit of the doubt. At the expense of the child. Yeah. And so what is the point of a Department of Children's Services? What is the point of any of these programs that the government has set up to protect kids, you know, it, it, when it doesn't work. Well, you know, what I don't understand is you have these these women that just want to be spiteful and get back at their exes that say, you know, he sexually assaulted my child. And somehow they get that to stick in court and then these guys have to go through hell who are innocent to actually see their kid. Sure. You know, and I am standing here honestly saying... I don't know what's going on, I'm not there, but this is what my four-year-old is telling me, and I'm concerned, and I'm scared. You know, why aren't we doing something to say, hey, there's a question here, and we have evidence to support that it's a valid question, that there is more than likely some kind of abuse going on, so we're gonna make you jump through these hoops to make sure that's not happening. And at every point, you've jumped through those hoops. You've never given up. No, I mean, why aren't they doing that for him? Why aren't right. they giving him these hoops and saying, right. hey, there's question here. They're saying, you know, I have CPS telling me, oh, yeah, this is typically how it goes. In another five to six years, she may have a full disclosure. I don't want my daughter going through this for five to six years. Mm -hmm. You know, if that's how we're set up, and that is how we're set up. We're set up to respond to a tragic event. 
we're not set up to help people avoid a tragic event. Mm -hmm. And it's difficult because the, the basis of our system is that you're supposed to be innocent and then proven guilty. But he's already been proven guilty. Right. So, really, if the family court had done what they were supposed to do and ordered visitation to go alongside with the no-contact order, the criminal no-contact order that he rightfully deserved, then we wouldn't be in this situation right now. Yeah. This wouldn't be a question. She wouldn't be continuously getting abused. She wouldn't be coming home having been potty trained for two and a half years with constant UTIs, constant vaginal infections, and constant diaper rash. Right. It wouldn't be happening. Well, I mean, it's... It is... I, I just don't have... Your story is the most clear-cut I don't know I absolutely hate everything that has happened to you and I wish that we could do better as a society for you and for your daughter and for your son I don't think society has anything to do with government it's a fair point so is there um, I mean is there anything that we've left out that you feel needs to be said So it's just, this will be something, this will be an ongoing battle for the rest of my life. Yeah. And, and then my family. I have both of the children in therapy. Uh, our, our puppy was just born, who I have lined up to train to become a therapy dog. Mm -hmm. um, because as long as, as long as my daughter is going through this, or as long as there's a question of, is she being abused there? And there's medical evidence and other evidence to support that it's a very good probability that she is um, she can't heal yeah and she can't grow from it so I have a little problem do you have an attorney yes um, a good one I mean you I, I'm not sure <laughs> <laughs> um, so when we first got an attorney I, I went through um, the victims advocacy unit and they assigned me to an attorney through the Christian Legal Clinic. Mm -hmm. And um, after bashing my head against a wall and being given um, two separate representatives because they switched over in the time frame that the case took, keep in mind this has been ongoing for five years now, um, finally they said, this is way over our head, we don't know what to do with this, we're going to try to get this other attorney who's supposed to be really great at this stuff, mm -hmm. to help you for free because she has so many free cases that she needs to do. Um, so in meeting with her, she was terrific at first, you know, and she explained a lot to me, and she said, you know, if, if we have enough CPS documentation that says, hey, yes, abuse is probably going on, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that this visitation is terminated. Mm -hmm. not, not even supervised, just terminated. Right. Um, which... You know, I, if she's being hurt, it needs to be ended. Yeah. And the probability is, you know, I'd say 95 to 5 that she is being hurt. Mm -hmm. um, too many things are just too coincidental. Right. You know, there's no way she is falling every single time she's there on something that's inserting into her, giving her an infection. Mm -hmm. that's, that's not a possibility. And there's no way that she is having such bad wiping skills at his place that she's getting a UTI infection there, but... When she didn't have it the years she was just with you. And doesn't have it the weeks that she's just with me. Right. I mean, that's that's kind of one thing we're seeing it, the pattern of in the every other week. She's so. she's an exceptionally bright little girl. The best memory on a, on a human being I may have ever seen. Uh, and, and it's really, I mean, you, when you read the CPS reports, which, by the way, took me four and a half months to get, they're supposed to give it to you within eight weeks. And it took me four and a half months of calling, going in there, sitting, constantly asking to talk to other people, trying to figure out where it is to actually obtain copies of them. Right. Um, so it wasn't until recently that I obtained those. But one of the more disturbing parts in them is, so Juliet tells them that her dad is hurting her. And then they question, then they question, um, so my daughter tells them that her dad is hurting her. 
um, because she told the therapist and the therapist called CPS and she does a partial disclosure with CPS. They put together a timeline and they question him about all the events, the hospital, the infections, her reporting to the therapist. And he states in there that he doesn't know why she's saying those things, that it's because I'm telling her to say those things and I've got her brainwashed. And then he says that he has no idea why, but I just started telling her to say that her dad isn't hurting her anymore. Well, not even a week later, Juliet starts saying, my daddy told me that he's not going to hurt me anymore. Mm. And tells that to the therapist. Um, you know, and that's that's his classic example of his classic m manipulation. You know, he's right. trying to make that look like it's me, but really when you think about it, if I'm trying to get her to say all this stuff, and I'm telling her to say this stuff, why would I all of a sudden say that when I just about have him to the point that he's going to go to jail for it? <laughs> Well, the the fact of the matter is, you've been completely ineffective in, if you had made all this up, you've been completely ineffective in doing anything about it. Yeah. So I mean, and I hate to say that, but that's just the truth. It's it's and it's not even a you thing. It's I mean, the is, system has failed you and your daughter at every turn. Well, my thought is, what is he trying to prove? Like, oh, she you know talks a lot of talk and just wants custody, but doesn't actually want to get me in trouble. You know, if he wants to know how I feel, it's you know I think that he should you know, go to prison and then find out what he's done to his daughter and they should beat the living hell out of him. Mm -hmm. I think that he deserves every despicable, horrible crime anyone can think of. Yeah. That's my personal opinion of him. My kids don't know that. Right. Never will my kids know that. I've spent, I mean, I basically lived with you guys for a period of six months. I mean, you lived here with me. I spent a ton of time. Uh, I mean, in a period of six months, I became their uncle. <laughs> Um, and Uncle Rice. <laughs> Uncle Rice. And uh, after that, hung out a, a lot just to, because it made you feel safe having somebody else in the house. You know, just, somebody, it, it allowed me to rest. Uh, yeah. It because, allowed me to put my guard down for a little bit. Because you rest. weren't alone. And over that period of time, and then, you know, we're, we don't spend as nearly as much time as we did. Uh, we get to see each other, you know, every couple weeks. But... I can tell you in the two years that I've known you, you've just never, ever, 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 ever said anything bad about either one of the kids' dads to the kids. You never, ever, ever, ever allowed anyone else to do that in their presence. You just tried to do everything you can to give them a healthy relationship with their other parent as long as it's safe and healthy. You know, and even in the face of what you've gone through, you personally have done your best to try and, I don't want to say spin it, but frame it in a way for the kids that then they can not hate the other person. You know, uh, you have never, ever, ever done what, frankly, I went through as a kid. My parents got divorced and both of my parents, there we were pawns and you have never done that to your kids. And so it is... Um, my duty, my goal, and my privilege as their mom is just to raise them to be not just functional members of society, but leaders of society. Yeah. People who are going to change the world and make it a better place. And they can't do that with hatred in their hearts. Yeah. And we can't change what's happened. And I can't blame myself. And I can't live in the, you know, in the fear. And I can't let them either. Yeah. Because they've got to be able to think with a clear mind and love with a full heart and they're not going to do that if they feel hatred and fear yeah it's just not going to happen well you've done an excellent job so you uh you've taught me a lot about being a better person and i know you have them too so is there anything else that you you know as we wrap up here is there anything else that you want to say I say we just get rid of all the judges in the court system. <laughs> Let's get all new ones in there. Um, so I'm not going to – normally we ask people to self-promote, but we're going to do the opposite with you. Uh, thank you guys for listening, and thank you for sharing your story. And I uh, – if you want to communicate with Amanda, if there's anything you want to say or if there's a note of encouragement that you want to send, then send it to Spangle – at wearelibertarians.com or uh, editor at wearelibertarians.com and I'll make sure she gets it. But Or if uh, you're going through it and you need help. Yeah, 
Absolutely. I um, have a lot of resources from this that I would be glad to get you in touch with. Yep. Yeah, if you have a, and maybe you're not the one going through it, if you have a family member and you even suspect something, or if you just need to talk stuff through, I know, I know that telling my story uh, publicly over the last year on Facebook has, uh, as I've been open about my divorce and what I've gone through, has led uh, me down a path where I've been able to to talk with others, counsel others and be a friend to other people that are going through it. And if you're going through a hard time or if you have a family member going through this stuff and you just need a word, then I know Karen, she lives to mentor and coach. Oh, shoot. <laughs> I know uh, I know that Amanda lives to mentor and coach and parent. <laughs> She's done a lot of that for me uh, over the last uh, two years. So thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing your story and being with us. And if you are in that situation, just realize it's a lifetime fight. Yep. There's not going to be a rest, but it is way worth it because you're worth it. Yep. I, I think if you look back five years, um, this has been a really tough five years for you. Um, but could you imagine not having done it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can. <laughs> um, but... You know, when you look back five years in my last five years, it seems really slow. But when I look back in my last five years, it seems like I took care of what I needed to take care of the best that I can. Yeah. And that, to me, is a life well lived. Well, thank you. Well, thank you for being uh, with us. And Well, thank you for being with us, and thank you for listening to this episode of We Are Libertarians. We'll talk to you next week. Okay.